All right, so just to recap on step number four, so you go through the process where you identify everything that you can do to the property in terms of those 140 ways, okay? And then you basically grab your uh, feasibility and you work out what those things are gonna cost you. If you can't fit them all into your budget, you're gonna come back and you're gonna cull, pick up the big things that are gonna add the, give you the biggest bang for your buck and away you go. <coughs> so let's assume that all stacks up. And what you're basically going to do then is you're going to then go, once you know that this is a deal, you have to go into step number five, which is basically acquiring the property. So this is how you go and negotiate on the property with the real estate agents. Now, there's a lot of information in this section, and I'm definitely not going to take you through all of it, okay? So what I, and also I am over time also, which is not unusual for me. So what I'm going to talk to you about is just the different ways that properties are sold. Pretty much properties are sold by private sale, private treaty, auctions and to a lesser degree you also have properties that are sold by express, expressions of interest a tender campaign so let's quickly just look at some of these things private sale properties are properties that aren't publicly advertised on the market so for example if you're having a chat to your neighbor next door Beryl and um, she says oh look I'm thinking about selling my house in about six months I'm thinking about moving on and you actually do a deal with her and you buy her house you technically just bought a property that was off market okay so start learning the lingo of what um, how agents talk what any property that's publicly advertised is on market. Any property that's not hit the market yet that is for sale is an off-market transaction, okay? So when you go and seek to the agents, what you want to be saying is, look, I want to, you know, is it possible that you can start bringing me these off-market transactions, okay? So start talking the language. Um, if you can, basically, uh, when you are dealing with private sale properties, this is where you know, you're going to acquire these properties, door knocking, letterbox dropping, or networking with the agents before they come onto the market. You've really got to develop trust with the owner, okay? If you are sitting in some old lady's house, you know, the reality is she's not going to sell you her property if she doesn't trust you. So be a good person. Do this with the utmost ethics. Um, and basically, as I said, I, I took you through yesterday the ways that you do that in terms of getting the valuation, okay? And as I said, I will get you a template in that regard. Okay, um, um, <clears throat> private treaty. Private treaty just means properties that are for sale, okay? So it's very different to private sale. It's just properties that are listed. So when you list your renovated property on the market, you can either, either put it to auction or you're going to put it for sale, okay? So that's technically called private treaty. Um, mostly in some states of Australia, you do have a cooling off period. In New South Wales, for example, you can take control of a property by, 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 by um, get entering a contract but you don't sign the 66W certificate. When the 66W certificate, it's a piece of paper within the contract that gives you a five-day due diligence period. So for some reason, if you decide that you don't want to go ahead with the property, you can exit that contract within five business days, but you lose 2.5% of the purchase price, okay? So for me, if I've got a really good unrenovated property where I've just stumbled across it and I want to take it, I want to act very quickly, quite often in Sydney, I will enter into a contract of sale. I won't sign the 66W certificate with the lawyer. So it gives me five days due diligence and it gives me five days up my sleeve to basically, so I've taken control of the property. I don't own the property yet. I've just taken control. And if for some reason I do my due diligence and I uncover and ravel some things where I don't want to pursue the property or I don't have time to do my feasibility and it doesn't stack up from a numbers perspective, then I will exit the contract and I will lose whatever it is, a thousand or two thousand dollars. I just put that down as a due diligence cost. You win some, you lose some, it all gets basically made up in the wash. I know it's probably hard for you to gauge that right now because, you know, with the levels that you're probably going to be starting at, but you just get to that level eventually where, you know, $1,000 here, $2,000 here isn't going to break the bank. So um, you just win some, you lose some in that regard. So for me, I'd rather take control of a property as soon as possible. And at least it gives me the option. I make the decision whether or not I want to pursue that property or not. Okay, now in other states of Australia, you don't actually have that. Some states don't have that option, okay? So as soon as you sign a contract, it will basically be binding, okay? So just be very careful about what contracts you do and don't sign. This is why you need to get a property lawyer. So I would encourage you, because it is all different in every state of Australia, I would encourage you maybe just to have a meeting with a lawyer, a quick half an hour, an hour meeting, and just finding out what the situation is in your own respective states. Okay, auctions. Who loves auctions? Okay, all right, and most people, so I think about three or four hands went up, most people hate auctions. Why do you love auctions, just out of curiosity? Any reason? I get a lot of bargains. You, bar you get a lot of bargains? Okay, cool, we're about to see you operating. What suburbs? I live in Mount Isa. Okay, in Queensland? Yeah. Okay, great. 
All right, most people don't like auctions, and the reason why most people don't like auctions is because they feel they have no control over an auction. Would that be fair to say? So there are some strategies that you can employ at an auction. Um, quite often, I will try and take control of an auction, um, and how successful you are with this will depend on how good the auctioneer is. There's one auctioneer in Balmain who's absolutely, uh, in fact, he's actually left now, which is really great. Um, but, you know, for the last 10 years, he's worked for um, one of the major real estate agencies who gets a lot of listings. And so I'd hate it, absolutely hate it when a good unrenovated deal would come up through their agency because I knew they were going to have very little success. Uh, it actually got so bad for me, particularly when I started, um, when I was today, tonight's renovator, I think it was into year two or year three of my professional career. Um, I was doing a lot of stuff with today, tonight. And uh, every time I went to an auction on a property that I was bidding for, you know what he'd say? Ladies and gentlemen, you've got TB Renovator over here. If she's bidding on this property, it's got to be a good one. So I was like, oh. So it actually got so bad one day that I said to Steve, oh, this really good unrenovated deal come up. I said, Steve, how are we like, going to get around this? Um, I said, as soon as we go there, like they're going to recognize us. And so I said to Steve, I've got an idea. I said, I reckon it'd be really funny. I said, why don't we go to the fancy dress costume shop? Why don't we get like a gorilla and a chicken suit? And actually we'll go to the auction. They won't know it's us. And I said, it'd probably make front page of the newspaper, like gorilla and chicken bought million dollar house. And Steve's so like, don't be, th be pathetic, Cherie. And I'm like, okay, whatever. Um, so we didn't, didn't know. I thought it was going to be fun. But he said, you've got to be professional. Anyway, <laughs> so spoils all the fun. <laughs> so, um, what you can do is, look, it, it, there are some tactics and there are some strategies. Uh, <laughs> there are some tactics and strategies for um, working at auctions. Um, auctions are a game and it's who plays the game the hardest. Now, with agents, you've got to know how, um, what I would encourage, or, sorry, is there anybody who hasn't been to an auction before? you have to get yourself to an auction. So start going to the auctions um, to see how they manoeuvre the crowd. Real estate agents are trained to basically come and approach buyers at auctions. So have you ever seen agents walking around the auctions going, okay, yep, yeah, next person. Um, so what happens is quite often, look, if you've, if you've even expressed a remote amount of interest, like you even said, oh, it's a really nice house, at the auction, right, and like not even taking it any further, the agent will walk around to people in the auction, in the crowd, saying, um, you know, you're interested in the house, even when they've given no buying signals. And what it does, it tells, it, when they keep going around to these individual people, what does it say to the other buyers? There's more interest than what there really is, okay? So one thing that I do is I always say to the agents, hey, look, I don't need any assistance today with bidding. Um, I'm comfortable doing that. I don't need any help from you. I'm always very polite. If an agent, sometimes they won't respect you in that regards, and they'll come up to you and say, uh, look, you know, try and whisper in your ear. And I just say, look, I don't need any help. Thank you. Like, I'm polite. If they, don't, if they disrespect me in that regards, if they're coming to me, I'll just like say, I'm sorry, I don't need any help, okay? Because the last thing I want is somebody getting in my ear, even though I'm smart enough to know not to go beyond my purchase price. So what happens is the agents will go to a person and they'll say, look, um, uh, uh, you know, this person over here, Joe and Sally over here, um, look, they're really getting really close to the limit. I think if you put another bid in, you might, you might just snag the property. So you go, oh, okay, okay. And so, <laughs> okay. $5,000, okay, we've got $450,000 over here. Okay, so off the agent trots. Uh, I know I might say making agents sound really bad, but this is the reality of what goes on out there. So they just go out there and say, look, um, Lucy and Sally over there, they're right up to their bidding limit. I think if you put another bid in, um, they might just, you might just get it. Okay, $5,000. So they do that, they come back to you and they go, they're right on their limit, they're right on their limit. $2,000, so that's what happens, okay? They just bounce buyers off and they, half the time they walk around to people who aren't even interested. So you just gotta be really careful of what, um, what happens at auctions. Now, I have a strategy for bidding at auction. As I said, as renovators, as professional property developers, your objective is to get the property as low as possible. So what I do is, you know when the agent, uh, actually the auctioneer, sorry, um, starts, you know, ladies and gentlemen, we're here for a, an auction and they read all the fine print. Actually, on, on my life to-do list, I am going to become an auctioneer at some point in time. Um, so, yeah, before I die, do you think I make a good auctioneer? Yeah. 
And so anyway, <laughs> so um, what I'm going to do is, you know, the agent always, the auctioneer always says, you know, ladies and gentlemen, I've got to read the fine print, the terms and conditions, so they go through all the contractual stuff. Then they'll say, ladies and gentlemen, okay, what we've got here is this beautiful, charming two-bedroom semi, oozing potential for some astute renovator to come in and add heaps of value to it, blah, blah, blah. Um, it's got this, it's wonderful, it's got a beautiful outlook, blah, 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 okay? They'll say, ladies and gentlemen, I'll open the floor to the first bid, okay? So they go, Every, what does everybody do? So it goes, ladies and gentlemen, where's the first bid? What's everybody do? I just wait. Everybody says nothing. <laughs> so what I do is if I'm attending the auction, let's say if it's a property that I want to buy at 600000 what I'll do is before the auctioneer has even said, ladies and so um, basically when they're, oh, and I know they're just about, they've finished all their dribble, um, and basically they're about to say, ladies and gentlemen, like I'll wait for that, ladies and gentlemen, 400000 I won't even wait. And they'll go, ooh, strong bid down here, 400000 I'm sorry, madam, but that's too low. I'm not going to take that bid. So I'd like to open the floor to who basically, who would like to put the first bid on on the property. What does everybody do? Wait. Wait. They'll go, looking for first bid, looking for first bid. Who would like to make the first bid? I'll come back in. 400000 <laughs> They'll go, um, all right, it's pretty low, madam, but thank you. I'll take that bid. Tell me who would like. So, you know, don't be scared to do that sort of stuff, all right? So for me, I take, like, I try and... So where this works a treat is then if you've got a bad auctioneer because don't assume that all auctioneers are good. You get your bad and your good ones. You've probably seen more your fair share of bad than good. It's very rare to get a good one. So um, basically, um, I'll go in, so 400,000. So then somebody else will bid 410,000. Four, I'll go in, 420 straight in. So needless to say, the auctions I go to are very quick to start with and I drag them down. So basically, yeah, 420, 430, 450. So what I do is I try and start the auction really as low as I can without being unrealistic. If it's a million dollar house, you don't go in at $600,000 because then you're just saying, don't be stupid, right? So you try and pick a point that's low, low on the very low side, but not unrealistic. So they go in 410, 420, 450, 450, blah, 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 blah. And then I'll basically pull out. Now, um, it's always good to have other people at auctions. The reality is, you know, they ban dummy bidding and all that sort of stuff, but there is strategies that you can employ, right? You know, you can, um, you know, just even your psychology, like for example, Steve and I used to get in fights at auctions. Um, and so this is particularly good as husband and wife that you can have a domestic at the auction. Because basically one person, you, you want to create fear in people at auctions, okay? Because what they do, a lot of people don't do due diligence. And so basically, uh, you want them to think that they haven't done their due diligence in some regard. So I would be there with Steve, and basically the auctioneer would come in. So when it hits the 450 mark, we'd start giving each other body signals going, you know, it's not worth it, you know, that sort of stuff, you know. And then you just ramp it up a bit, okay? So, you know, basically saying, it's, you know, it's... Um, <laughs> So you'd be saying, say, so like bodies, because people watch other bit, other buyers at the auction, okay? So this, you know, and it's, you know, it's particularly good if you know one of you like looks like looks like a builder, um, basically like where the the house, the builder's going, I can't make it work. There's too much, and the old thing, you know, the contamination's going to cost fifty grand, <laughs> whatever. That sort of stuff works to treat at auctions, because what it does is scares the living daylights out of other people. In our early days, we had a lot of fun with this, where we'd actually have um, multiple people. So we would stake different buyers. Um, so we're all obviously bidding on the same behalf. But I'd have, uh, you know, when dummy bidding was, was uh, rife. And look, in some regards, dummy bidding is still around today because people don't realise it. There's still a lot of it around. It's about how smart you want to be. You've got to be very careful with this, right? Because if they find out, you can have massive fines and Department of Fair Trading, those government bodies do do random inspections and things. But um, what we used to do is we used to have three parties. So we'd all be separate. And basically, uh, this person would pull out. So they'd bid, and basically, um, that person would go, I'm sorry, I just, there's no money in it for me, and they'd leave. Okay? So what does that tell people? Ooh, oh, maybe I'm overestimating something. And then basically, Steve would be over here, and he'd be going through, he'd bid, I would bid, and then, you know, Steve would say, mate, I'm out. There's no money in it for me, something like that. And then I'd basically go in for the kill at the end. So there are some strategies. Now, it's getting harder to do that sort of stuff. But what you want to do is your objective at auctions is to slow the auction down as possible. So go in strong, really um, right up start. You know, start low, not too low, but low enough. 
basically the bidding will jump up fairly quickly. And then if I was to get to say 500 or 510 for a property I want to pay 600, I will drop the increments down to like 515. So I'll start to slow them down. So at 500,000, I'll go 505. Now the auctioneer might say, I'm sorry, madam, but I'm not going to take 10,000 increments. So I'll just go then go quiet. Okay, so your objective is to slow the auction down as soon as possible and then you know, jump down to $1,000 increments. And you, you just say, you just say, don't be scared to say to the auctioneer, you're going to leave any money in it for me? Like that sort of stuff. So like you, it's pretty gutsy to do that sort of stuff at an auction. But if you can save $10,000 or $20,000, it's been a good morning, hasn't it, at auction? So, you know, that fear, um, and, you know, whose problem is that? It's not, you know, it's not you being awful. It's just you're doing your job well as a developer. The auction, the agents? Yeah, so you've got to be careful with that. Yeah, absolutely. So what he's saying is, won't that get your agents offside? So, yes, potentially it could. So you've got to just, you know, manage tact there as well. So, yeah, you don't want to destroy any relationships. And your agents probably hope to pray that you're not going to an auction that they're selling. So, yeah. You were talking about uh, good auctioneers and bad auctioneers. How do we tell the difference? You'll know this from your property inspection, step number three. So when you start attending the open for inspections and auctions, you're going to know who the good ones are and who the bad ones are. Quite often, when it comes to step number eight, selling your property, quite often the dilemma you might have is that, and I certainly experienced this in Balmain, is that um, they had the absolute best agent with a bad, who worked for a certain agency, really good agent, but a crappy auctioneer. And the good auctioneer was the agent that had, was with the agency that didn't really have any, you know, standout agents. So quite often I said this one particular agent, I said, why don't you go across to this agency here? So and they're like, no. So um, sometimes that's a dilemma. Um, what's more important, a good auctioneer or a good agent? If I had to choose, it'd be the... Hmm. The agent, I think, because they can always pass mm. it in at auction and then they go, the agent can go in and negotiate afterwards. Okay, so but if, if I was at the auction, how would I tell? How would I know whether uh, an auctioneer You'll know before bad? the auctioneer. You'll know before the auction from step number three because you're going to be going to the um, open for inspections and you're going to be watching auctions as part of your step number three. So you'll know, you just know. You know who's good at their job and who's not. You can okay. tell a bad auctioneer stumbles around, properties get passed in. Like, for example, we've got a, we had a really good agent in, in, in Balmain and um, he would always say, you know, come on, if you just give me another bid, I'm going to make sure this property is yours. He's saying, you know, hey, look, why don't you do this to the house? Like, it was almost like me saying, you can do this, you can do this, blah, blah, blah. So he was like really good. He squeezed every single dollar. He'd say, hey, mate, you're going to take a long-term view on this property. Who cares if you pay an extra five grand? You're going to make a hundred grand in the next 10 years capital growth. What do you care? So that's a good auctioneer. Most other agents would be, both auctioneer, auctioneers would be going, uh, you know, am I going to get, a, who's going to pass another bid? Who's going to give me another bid? Who's going to give me another bid? So you get a different, you get just different levels. It's like any occupation. You get good people, you get bad people. Um, okay. Never submit offers prior to an auction. If you're going to, if an unrenovated property comes on the market, particularly deceased estates, deceased estates have the best unrenovated deals, okay? Because this is unfortunately Nanny and Poppy who've passed on, who've had their house for the last 50 or 60 years that hasn't been renovated. So if a property is going to auction, you generally shouldn't offer any, make any price offers prior to auction unless you are 100% confident that the property can be sold, can be purchased prior to auction. Now, some vendors definitely do sell prior to auction, which deceased estates, there's a 99.99% chance that you can never acquire it because when a deceased estate is being sold, it's being sold by probate, which is a government department, and they will never allow the property to change hands until it goes publicly because what, happened is, what has happened in the past is the beneficiaries of the, of the estate have said, hey, that real estate agent sold that property 50 grand under market value and they've just dipped me out of $50,000 of my inheritance because they sold it to their best friend for a cheaper price. So government departments always are on the side of caution, so there's no grey matter. So deceased estates always go to auction in literally 99.9% .9 of the time. So um, never, if you can, never submit offers prior to auction. If a property, an unrenovated property comes on the market and it is going to auction and you are generally interested, 
what you should always do is ask the agent for a contract of sale. Normally, most real estate agents, they will at least, if the property is going to sell prior to auction, they will almost 100% of the time at least give anybody who's holding a contract a courtesy call to let them know that the property is going to sell prior to auction and you will have your opportunity at that point to basically submit your highest offer. Okay, so what agents are looking for is that when you go through these unrenovated properties that are going to auction, one of the first thing they're going to say to you is, you know, what, what do you think the property is worth? Okay, so you think it might be a very innocent question, and it is in some regards, but they will take your feedback and they'll give it to the next buyer. So if you say, look, I think it is worth 600000 they're going to go back to the next buyer coming through the door. The market feedback has been in the low sixes. And as I said yesterday, what it does, people then go, okay, well, the feedback's been low sixes. We know that we're not going to get this property now for 580000 thousand which we were originally thinking we now have to be at a minimum probably 610 615 to even have a shot at acquiring this property so maybe we should go to 620 or 630 bump our price up so we've got a really good chance of getting it so they psycho psychologically start bumping their price up as to what they're willing to pay for their property so if you can try and avoid discussing price whatsoever what are you going to say to them when an agent says you know um what do you think the property is worth <laughs> haven't crunched the numbers yet so I'm not sure, I just haven't crunched the numbers yet. Now, obviously, if you've got a good relationships with the agency, you're going to start to give them more information. Always, you know, don't ever tell people the price in front of other buyers. So just say, look, Chris, give me a call later. I'll, I'll let you know my thoughts on the property. So when you have that good relationships with the agent, then you can start to disclose some of that stuff because I know you don't muck around. That you're, you're in a totally different um, league to the weekend warriors, okay? So... Yeah, be careful of that. Um, vendor bids. Vendor bids are basically when um, a, a vendor puts a property on the market and it doesn't sell. So they, you know, they, the auctioneer says, "Ladies and gentlemen, who's who? Who'd like to give me the first bid or the property? You know, a couple of people bid. Maybe they want six hundred thousand for the property. The auction stalls at five hundred and thirty thousand. The auctioneer will make a bid on behalf of the vendor. That's called a vendor bid. Now, when you go to auctions, you've got to be very careful because what happens is that the prop, the age, the auctioneer will make a vendor or bid so they'll pass it in at say and they always do a vendor bid close to where the, the owner wants their price so if they want 600 they do a, uh, do a vendor bid at like 595 or 590 it's always very close and what happens is it gets reported in the paper that basically the, the last price down was 595,000 a lot of newspapers now report it as a BB in the little notations you'll see BB which stands for vendor bid you just got to be really careful of this because basically the fact of the matter is is that the real bidding stopped at 530000 right? But then the auctioneer exercises a vendor bid at 595000 They pass the property in because people aren't... So don't ever bid against yourself with the, an auction bid. So the auctioneer, you might bid, say, 530000 Auctioneer goes, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to exercise a vendor bid at 590000 Who would like to place, place the next bid at five... You know, if you bid... The next person who basically places a bid will own the property, OK? Because it's close to the reserve price. So everybody goes quiet. Nobody bids everybody goes home they pass the property in so the property doesn't get sold what happens is in 99 percent of cases the agent will actually pass the property in the auctioneer will pass the property in sorry that property will go on the market for like 610,000 or 600,000 whatever it may be Joe and Sally, unsuspecting buyers, come along one weekend, two weekends after after the property's been passed in. They say to the auction, what's the, what's the situation with the property? The agent's going to say, the property went to auction, it got passed in. What do you think the first question that Joe and Sally's going to ask? How much? What figure do you think Joe and Sally's going to be told? Five ninety-five. Okay? Really, the vendor bid got passed in at five thirty. That was the true market value at the time, not five ninety five. Joe and Sally, okay, five hundred ninety five. That's what the market said. They're wanting six ten. We're going to stick our heels in. Let's offer them only six hundred six hundred grand and try and get this property. You know, agent back agent plays the game. Oh look, I don't think that's going to do it. They really want six hundred and ten. That's the reason why they passed it in auction at five ninety five. But um, look, I'll make a phone call for you and see what I can do. So they don't even half the time make a phone call. And basically, they come back and say, look. Joe and Sally, if you're willing to sign the contract today at 600000 you can get that property at a $10,000 discount. If you sign the contract, you move fairly quickly. So can you see how people can pay like $10,000, $50,000 more for a property because they didn't ask one fundamental question, which is what was the real bid? Was it a market bid or was it a vendor bid? Okay, so make sure. The beautiful thing is that, um, you know, if you're out doing the rounds with your due diligence and attending the auctions, you'll pick this sort of stuff up. So when you're doing your due diligence system, you want to make sure you know whether something was a real market bid or a real, a real vendor bid in your due diligence system. 
Okay. <clears throat> okay, let me talk to you about deceased estates. Um, deceased estates, as I said, the public trustee sells deceased estates, and as I said, they can be absolutely beautiful properties to acquire. There is absolutely no point in ever trying to acquire a property prior to auction. Any property that you're interested in, make sure you get a contract of sale so they know you are interested, but you do not give the agent any information whatsoever. Most people think with deceased estates that you have no right to negotiate in any way, shape or form. That is incorrect. You can certainly negotiate a minimal deposit. You can certainly negotiate extended settlement with a government agency who's selling a deceased estate, what you will never ever be able to achieve is early access, okay? So minimal deposit, extended settlement are quite um, readily available for deceased estate, but you have to start negotiating these terms and conditions like at least a week before the auction. The more the merrier, like if you can do this two weeks down, because you've got to understand that you're dealing with a number of layers of people, like government, you've got to go through the agent to get to the government department, sometimes that can be a little bit slower, so don't ever leave this to like one or two days before the auction because you may not get your response in time. Whatever they agree to, you have to print it out and you have to take those conditions that have been agreed to, your solicitor's letter, if it goes through your solicitor or if you've just been dealing with the agent directly, make sure you print it out, you take it to the auction because if that hammer goes down in your favour, you have to show those conditions to the auctioneer so they can adjust the settlement time from 42 days to 84 days, whatever it may be. So you definitely do have negotiation ability with deceased estates. Okay, preliminary in, in negotiations. When you're starting the negotiation process, as I said, you don't want to give buying signals when attending open for inspection. So I've already spoken to you at quite at length about that. So you just don't want buyers to show um, to know when you're genuinely interested in a property. So you want to be quite conservative in that regard. Um, really take a flippant approach, like I couldn't care less in front of other buyers through a property. Um, when they see you coming in, scanning, just walking through the property, go walking like that, just going in. So the, I, when I do a property inspection, I'm in and out in like less than a minute, okay? So just walk in, walk out. Um, just go and then I'm out, okay? So I'm just not giving those buying signals. You've got to know when to negotiate and when not to as well. This was a deal in Byron Bay. Uh, I like particularly like going to Byron Bay uh, every now and then and because I um, don't buy shoes or anything, I just go buy houses wherever I go. Um, I was looking for a holiday. I thought it might be nice to have a holiday house in Byron Bay. And I've been sort of doing a little bit of due diligence on Byron Bay. So I went in and I found this um, house right in the middle. It was in Ruskin Street, right in the town centre of Byron Bay. So I was in a really good spot. Took my RP data report. I'd already done some preliminary due diligence. I, had, I felt I had a good understanding of the market. Now this property um, that came up in its unrenovated state, literally the agent had got the contract and I was the first person to hear about this property. I said to the agent, have you got any unrenovated houses you know, in that, um, it's called Old Byron, which is the town centre. And um, they said, actually, I've, I've just got the listing for this property, I've just got the contract, it's about to come on the market, little house in Ruskin Street. I said, how much do they want for it? And he said, 575. Now, I knew any day of the week that this property was worth 620, 630, any day of the week. Anyway, I thought I'd be cute and start the negotiating game. So I said, look, I'll give them 500 and, I think it was 530,000. Can I get extended, like slightly extended settlement of three months and minimal deposit? And he said, okay, I'll, I'll, he took the offer and he said, I'll phone the agent, I'll, um, I'll phone the vendor and see what they say. Anyway, he phoned the agent. He never phoned me back. Most normally when you put an offer in, agents phone you back. This particular agent didn't phone me back. A week passed. I went up in holiday mode. I was on the beach. I forgot about it. And then I realised one day, hey, that offer, I didn't hear back from the agent. So I called the agent back. I said, well, um, what happened to my offer? And he said, they didn't want it. So he didn't get back to me. And I said, oh. Um, okay, well, I'll give them 500. So I thought, okay, I'll review, I'll crunch the numbers. I played all the games, crunch the numbers. Um, I went to him, came back, rang him back like half an hour later, so I'll give you 550,000 for the property. He goes, okay, I'll take it back to the vendor. Rang me back, said, no, they're not accepting it. Another week, so I thought I'll play the waiting game now. So I thought, I'll just sit on it for five days. So sat on the, um, sat on the property for a week, didn't hear back from him, didn't call me, he wasn't chasing me. I called him, I said, look, what's happening with that property? He said, I told you, Cherie, they want 575,000. I went, Oh, all right, I'll give you 570. If I can get three months extended settlement, I'll give you the full purchase price. He goes, okay, now we're talking. So basically he went back to the vendor, made the phone call. That afternoon, the vendor had taken it upon themselves to organize a bank valuation. It came in that afternoon and the bank valuation came in at 623,000. So he rang me back and said, look, they've got a valuation, 623. I said, I'll give them 575 and I'll settle right now, right? So now I was like on the back foot. And he goes, Shree, they've actually now made a decision to take that property to auction. 
And I went, I'll give you 620,000. Like I knew this was a structural runner. I could have made a couple of hundred grand on this. Anyway, he goes, no, they're taking it to auction now. They're, like, they're, they're not going to sell now price. So they, they stuck their, their, their boots in firm. Anyway, that property went to auction. Guess how much it sold for like four weeks later? 697,500. So I was being cute, trying to skimp on 20, because we're all in the mindset of crying. Everybody thinks, like we're all brainwashed by, uh, I guess, other like things we hear in the media, other seminar presenters, all these books that say, buy property at wholesale. It doesn't happen, guys. Like it just seriously doesn't happen. Very, very rare. Um, and so I, I was obviously trying to skimp on, on $30,000. By skimping on $30,000, I lost like over $100,000 that I could have made. I could have made over 100 grand before I even got the keys to the house. So I lost that deal by not negotiating right. So you've got to be conscious of this. If you know a property is truly worth its value, just go ahead, stop all the game playing. Just go ahead, do the deals. The agents will like you better for it. They'll be more respectful from you in that regard. Okay, when making offers, you're not going to pull them out of air, thin air. You're going to take your property due diligence system and you're basically going to justify your prices. So as I said yesterday, when uh, property comes on the market, you know, um, you go to the agent and you say, yeah, Chris, I want to buy this property. It's like always let an agent know that you are interested in buying a property. Don't ever play the game of trying to keep it a secret. Say, yeah, I'm interested in buying a property. But Chris, I don't want to buy that house for 600000 because it's clearly overpriced. My due diligence system, Chris, is telling me that on that particular sale, that is very similar to 127 Evans Street. That sold for 540000 Same land size, similar condition, sold for 540000 You're asking a $60,000 premium for this property. Number three, Fred Street, that's off for 620. That one had off-street parking. This property has none, Chris. So Chris, I'm interested in buying this property, but why would I pay a premium for it? You tell me why. What do you think Chris is going to say? I don't know. <laughs> What's he going to say? <laughs> I'll see my therapist. Okay. I should get Chris in here, eh? Would you like me to? Yeah. What would we say to him? <laughs> you poor sucker. <laughs> That's probably. Hey, how do you put up with her? Yeah. <laughs> I'd probably be too scared to bring him up. Okay, no, I'm not joking. All right, so um, your agents will have a lot more respect for you as a professional, as a, like they literally they will know you're a developer in the area and they will have a lot more respect for you when they can go, they can see you're monitoring the market, you're doing this in a very professional because they've really got no comeback. Now, some of them might be flipping and say, well, you know what, Sheree, some weekend warrior is going to come along and just pay it anyway. So sometimes, you know, it can go that way. But, you know, if you're really trying to deal, like try and justify your price. And quite often what I'll say, I say, look, do I need to meet with the vendor? Like, why don't you just get the vendor in here and I can show them, you know, I want to buy this property, but I'm going to show them the reasons why, you know, they're similar properties. So sometimes vendors live in fantasy land about thinking what their properties are really worth. Okay, so don't be scared to take in a couple of tools. As a professional renovator, definitely take in your property due diligence system, take in your resale calculators, your purchase price calculators, like, and your financial feasibility. Show them those tools so you know that you are doing this in a business-like manner. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take you through the key negotiation tools that you should use as professional renovators. Now, when, again, this is all relating now to how you submit your offers, okay? So Paul went through how the finance works, work, world works yesterday, and I want to talk to you about this morning the key things that you can do in terms of your negotiation techniques when you're starting to deal with agents and start, starting to submit offers on properties. Okay, first of all, minimal deposit. The standard is what? 10%. I've never paid 10% in my whole life. Um, I typically pay 3% or 5%. These days, if you ask the agent if you can pay 5% deposit, almost 99.9% .9 chance that they'll say yes. In the contract, they can still, if you do default, they can still come after you for the remaining 5%. So in the contract, it basically says 10% deposit, but 5% is only payable, okay? So don't get tripped up on that. Um, so there's really no risk to the vendor. Most people, when they sign a contract, don't, def don't default. So get into the habit of basically trying to pay at the very minimum um, uh, sorry, at the very most, 5% deposit. Who's actually bought a property on less than 5% deposit? Lots of people. Okay, yell out some figures. What have you paid? $1,000 $1, on what value house? 200000 $200, What else? Uh, $1,000 each on to 
Okay, thousand dollars each. So ask the question. So just say to the agent, because at the end of the day, as renovators, you want to try and leave as much money in your bank account, not somebody else's. You're only saving fifty or a hundred dollars in interest or two hundred dollars interest, but you know what? It's two hundred dollars extra profit that you've actually earned in your projects. Okay, so minimal deposit all the way. A thousand dollars on a three hundred and eighty thousand. Beautiful. We actually had uh, a student who actually said the real estate agent paid him, paid the deposit for him. It was at Christmas. He obviously wanted to get the deal across the line, so the agent actually paid the deposit, and it was actually fixed up at the end. So, you know, you can do anything. You've just got to ask the question. For those people who are on really tight finances, like basically get into the habit of asking for minimal deposit. <coughs> okay. Second thing. Early release of the deposit. Now, when you actually pay your 5% deposit or whatever figure it may be, one great negotiation tool is actually to release that to the that deposit to the vendor once the contract is signed. You've got to think too that a lot of people actually um, sell houses. One main reason that people sell houses is because they're under financial pressure. So basically, when you release the deposit to the vendor, they can actually go and use that cash for something else. They might want to go buy a car, holiday. They might want to use that deposit basically as a deposit on their next property, which happens more often than not. So this is great. When you know the vendor's needs, when a vendor says to you, look, they've bought somewhere else, oh, they're wanting to buy somewhere else, if you know what their motivations are for selling, then releasing the deposit to the vendor is a really great negotiation strategy for actually getting the deal across the line. Okay, but you can't do that unless you know what the vendor wants. So remember yesterday I said that when you're starting to structure and submit your offers, one thing you always want to find out about is why, why is the person selling the property? Because instead of you having to preempt or second guess what they're trying to do, when you ask the agent and they tell you, then you can structure your offer. So all you're doing is you're structuring an offer that meets the buyer's needs, vendor's needs, sorry. Um, extended settlement. Now, this is an absolutely huge one for renovators. As I said, uh, I think it was on day one, don't ever settle early on a property. So in New South Wales, the standard settlement is 42 days. In other states of Australia, it's 30 days, 60 days, 90 days in some states. So never ever settle early. What you want to do as a renovator, you want to push the extended the, ex the settlement out as long as possible. So for me as a renovator, what I always do, I always as a structural renovator, I always negotiate four months extended settlement. So what I pretty much do is this. Could I have one of the crew up on being my whiteboard assistant again today, that'd be good. Um, what I basically do is I will buy the property here, okay? I will always negotiate four months extended settlement, so four months here. So I'm settling here. Uh, you got one, two, three, four, that's the months. So typically when I sign, when I sign a deal saying, yes, I've just bought this house, I've signed the contract right here, what's the first thing I'm doing? getting my DA prepared. So I'll phone, I'll phone a surveyor. That normally takes one week here for the surveyor. So that's where I ring them up and say, John, this is the next site address, you know, 93 Hill Street. Can you go out and do a full development application survey? So I normally do my one, that, so that whole process. So as soon as I sign that contract, I am on the phone straight away to the surveyor. Like for me, every single moment counts as a renovator. This is a big problem with a lot of renovators. They go, oh, I'll get to it next week. A week ticks by with them. They go, oh, okay, I'll do the survey here. And then they, you know, they don't chase up the surveyor. The surveyor takes a week and a half, you know, because there's no priority on it. Two weeks ticks by and then suddenly they phone up and make an appointment with their architect or their draftsman and the architect or draftsman says, oh, a bit busy this week, I can see you end of next week, so you just lost another two weeks there. So this is what happens, this is how my, my development applications go through, through very quickly because what I'm doing is I'm keeping an emphasis on time because for me, I know that I've got daily holding costs of $280 and if I don't make work, significant work happen, it's coming out of my back pocket. So I always make sure, as soon as I sign the contract, make that phone call to John the surveyor. John, this is the next project. Can you come out and do a full DA survey? So he turns it around very quickly. So this is important. When you're establishing your contacts with your consultants, say to them, I'm in the business of being a professional property developer, renovator. Time is absolutely important for me. So when I do phone you with that first deal, could you please drop everything and give it your highest priority because I need to turn this through very, very quickly. So you only really have to tell them that once and then they will know that just Cherie's coming, um, you know, and they know that you, know, you want things done pretty quickly. 
<clears throat> they'll also have more respect for you, I think, as a professional because they can see you're doing this in a business-like fashion and you're just not letting things drag on. Okay, so one week for the surveyor. When the surveyor, because the architect can't start drawing, they, the architect can start doing doodling and doing their high-level, you know, concept plans and all that sort of stuff, but they can't actually do their CAD drawings until they've got the site measurements from the surveyor. So they get the site measurements. Typically, my architect uh, turns it around in two weeks. So the DA, this is all the DA preparation. Okay, two weeks. And then pretty much, you know, around the three-week mark, mark, four weeks at the absolute most, my DA is lodged in council. Now, in my council, it's approximately two and a half to three months. So pretty much all of this process here, this timeline here, to get council approval. <clears throat> I've then got, once I get the stamp saying, yep, your development's application's approved, what I'm then doing is applying for my CC, my construction certificate application. So we'll talk about this all in step number six. But I apply for my CC right here. That's my permission. So once you get development application, you've got to apply for another construction certificate for your permission to construct the actual building. So that's CC approval right here. That takes one week typically. And then I settle here. So guess what's happening? On the day I settle, what am I doing? I'm starting construction. So a lot of people, they just, they sign the contract and they don't do anything during that settlement period. And then they get the keys on day one. They go, okay, I got the keys. Now what? Maybe we should start thinking about getting the DA through Sally or John or whatever it may be. And they've just lost all that period. So if you settle early, you're actually doing yourself an injustice because if you settle early here, let's say you just settle normal time, you know, 42 days or six weeks, whatever it may be, you're suddenly incurring holding costs from here to here on a property that is sitting that you can't do anything with. So always don't be unrealistic with an extended settlement. Work out what sort of time frame you need and then basically you target it from that. Don't go to a vendor and say, give me one year extended settlement. They're going to say, go away, okay? So make sure it's realistic. Try and build in an extra little bit of fat on the end for delays in council and little hiccups, whatever it may be. If you're doing a cosmetic renovation, 42 days is, as I said, in New South Wales is standard and most other states it's always around that 30, 60, 90 days. But even if you're a cosmetic renovator, ask for an extra two or three weeks just to get tradies lined up, your project plans, go shopping to do your bulk so that when you're ready to get the keys, you're ready to jump in and go for it. Okay. Early access prior to settlement. Has everybody, anybody ever heard, not heard of this before? Okay, early access to the property. Okay, so what you can do is this. If the vendor will allow you you can actually get in and start renovating the property before you actually settle. So what you do, so, yep. what you do is this. Let's say you're going to do a cosmetic reno. So you're buying the property here. This is where you buy. You're going to settle. Let's say you negotiate 12 weeks extended settlement. So I'm just instead of asking, so in some states this is normal, three months, okay? Um, so 12 weeks you settle. So you're only asking for an extra six weeks settlement. What you can do is you can actually come in as a renovator. So you've got your weeks down here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, a bit out. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. How long is it going to take you to do a cosmetic reno? Six weeks, okay? So you can come in here and basically have the renovation finished all through here. So this is the reno, it's complete here, complete. Now let's say we buy a house at 300K. What's the property gonna be valued at, at the six week mark, renovators? What's the property? We've just got in. We bought a house for 300 grand and we're going to renovate it. What should that, at the six week mark, after we finish renovating it at six week? All right, we're starting this workshop again. All right. <laughs> okay, if we're buying a house at 300K, what should we be reselling that for? Cosmetic reno. 
426,000, 300,000 times 142%. Remember the calculation? Okay, cool. So we're going to basically be, it's going to be basically valued at 420K through here. We settle over here. So what you can technically do, if you can get immediate access before you settle, what you can do is you can actually get the bank to come in and revalue the property at the six-week mark and they will base it on the new improved value, not the original purchase price. Now, not every bank does this. This is actually one really good strategy for those people who've got next to no money. This is a really great strategy. I'll do the sums for you. I have to write this down because I always get confused with this one. Um, so 300K, not confused, but I just always muddle my figures up. Um, you're buying a property for 300K. <clears throat> At this point, you don't have to worry about what the bank is going to lend you because you're getting and you're going to rip it apart, put it all back together again. It's going to be a higher value. So you, we know that we owe the bank 300K here, right? Bank owes. Now, if you can get a minimal deposit, if you can say to the vendor, look, can I get, um, what I do is I'd like to negotiate with you on this property, if I can get immediate, immediate access with extended settlement, and I'd like to put, a, say, a $5,000 deposit down and get in and renovate the property, okay? Now, look, not everybody is going to allow you to do this. Unrealistic to think that you go to 20 vendors and 20 vendors are going to say, yes, happy days, no problem. You might take this to 20 vendors, you might have one vendor say yes. It's just a numbers game. If you use my offer template to actually structure your offers, you've got a much better chance of getting this across the line. Now, the bank is going to, we know the property value should be around the 426 ma. What is the bank going to lend you? What percentage of that? 80%. So 80%. The bank is going to lend you 340,800. You only need 300 to buy the property, right? Now, in the meantime, you're incurring costs here, right? You've got your 10% reno cost. You've got literally no acquisition cost at this point because where are your acquisition costs coming? Over here on settlement. So you've literally got no acquisition costs. The only real cost you're incurring is your finance cost. You might have a month or so. Actually, you've got no finance cost either because you haven't settled yet. And your professional costs, you might have some costs with, you've got no costs really. You might have some due diligence costs, but it'd be bugger all really, thousand bucks maybe. Um, the only really cost you've got are your reno cost at this point. Now we know, what are our reno costs going to be? 10%, $30,000. So you're going to have $30,000 going out the door. So I guess what this is saying is that you're going to basically, sorry, Helen, to stand in front of you. Basically, you're going to, the bank is going to lend you. So the bank lends you 340 at this point. You've incurred. So you're going to have to cough up some money. They're going to have to find 30 grand at least to basically underdo this strategy. I'm sure that if, all, if you all had to, you could cough up 30 grand or pull 30 grand from somewhere at worst case scenario. And whatever deposit you negotiate, a minimal deposit, but you have to outlay this 30 grand up front, but you will get it back when it basically gets revalued at, this, at some point through here when the bank revalues and that goes through. So at the end of the day, when you get to this point where you've got settle, you, have, you, you know you're getting 340,000, right? You're getting 340 over here when you have to settle. $300,000 is going to pay back the vendor and the $40,000 you're going to pay back whoever you bought, begged, borrowed, stole that from, they're going to be paid that back. And basically, I've worked out that you end up with about a, a deficit of about 10000 So you'll only have about $10,000 going out because you've got your acquisition and cost and all this sort of stuff that come out through here, okay? So you will be $10,000 out of pocket, but you will have equity in the property of seventy five grand because you've got that buffer in between that value and that value. All right? So... It is one way that you can get a start in renovating with little, very little money. You know, what's one obvious source of money? If you had to get $30,000 right now, what is one way that most people overlook? Credit card. Credit card debt. So I've had some students come in and said, look, we've got enough for the deposit for a, like a low budget $300,000 house. We've got enough for the deposit. We've got sixty grand, but we've got no money to do the reno. And I say... Go to Westpac, go to ANZ, go to Citibank, go and get three credit cards, $10,000 each, short-term debt, get in, do the six-week reno, 
maximize those credit cards and then as soon as that property settles you instantly pay back those credit cards and away you go there's your answer so people say oh credit card debt like you know so what short-term debt as long as it's not dragging on for a year or two that's a different story so you get in you get out very very quickly Okay, early access. Now, when you do this extent, um, immediate access, you do need a legal contract, okay? Because the reality is you're about to get in and rip somebody's house to shreds. Now, there is some risk associated with this. I would say be very careful about who you do this with. If, you've got, um, if you're sitting in front of Nanny and Poppy and they're 96 years old, I would seriously consider whether you do this. Because um, the reality is if you get in and rip somebody's house apart and they die if you're in the unfortunate situation where they just they die in the middle of it all, then what happens is it can become a court issue because what they'll then say is the family members, the, the beneficiaries of their will will say, well, hang on, that property wasn't worth 426, that was only worth 360 or now you've ripped it apart and now you've just, just um, trashed my grandfather's house. So can you see how it's a real grey area? So, you know, young, healthy people, you know, you great to do with. Um, you just want to make sure you're just not dealing with somebody extremely old and you want to make sure you're dealing with somebody who's mentally sound as well. So you just don't want to. So be careful, uh, you know, suss the vendor out a little bit if you can as well. You do need a legal contract for that. Now you've got this on your legal contracts disc which we'll hand out to you shortly. So when you're submitting an offer, as when you are submitting an offer to a real estate agent, um, you're going to be submitting my templates and you're also going to be emailing through the legal contract. So you attach it to the contract of sale because otherwise what will happen is you'll phone Chris, the real estate agent. Sorry, John, those screens have gone off. Um, you'll phone Chris, the real estate agent, and what will happen is you'll say, look, Chris, can I get immediate access extended settlement? And if you don't have a legal contract, um, what they'll say is, They'll just put you in the too hard basket because then they go, oh, the lawyers have got to go and draw up a legal contract and that's going to cost two and a half thousand dollars. Are you going to pay for that or is it expecting the vendor to pay for that? It's a, you know, it takes two weeks to draw up the legal contract. But when you email it through saying legal contract for early access attached or ready to go, are you going to be somebody who's easy to do business with now? This is the problem. Most people don't get past first base because they don't have the right tools at their disposal. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, so that's, that's strategy five, extended settlement with immediate access. Now, sometimes even if you can't get the two in combination, you can get early access to a property for the purposes of measuring up quotes, all sorts of things. So at, sometimes the vendors will say, look, no, I don't want you to start ripping apart my property. What you'll find is that quite often me and you, let's say if I'm a, I'm a buyer and you're a vendor, you might say, yes, yeah, Sheree, I'm more than happy to give you access to my property. And then suddenly, so we agree on that. And then it goes to the solicitors and guess what? it gets knocked on the head because you've got a really conservative solicitor saying, oh no, don't do that. Like if she, if she does this. So quite often it can fall down there. So you just got to, when you go to them with your early access agreement, I also include a copy of my uh, public liability insurance as well. So when I'm submitting my offer, I submit my offer, I submit my early access agreement, and I also um, attach my public liability insurance cover to allay any fears that they are going to basically be sued if a tradesperson injures themselves on this on their property while I'm basically undergoing the renovation. So it just, um, again, most people don't think to do that and it just alleviates all those fears. It'll help you get the deal across the line. Okay. <clears throat> There's lots of examples in your manual there of where I've worked out all those figures for you. So just at your own leisure, read through, through them so you totally understand them. Okay, so there's those figures there. Okay, all right. Use a development application as a negotiation tool. So sometimes you can go into a vendor and say, look, I'm going to be investing quite a lot of money with you in terms of doing your development application. I'm going to be spending 20 grand getting the property approved. Now, for some reason, it doesn't go my way or I don't pursue that. You've basically got that intellectual property at your disposal. So it's just a, a tiny little thing that you can basically negotiate. Okay, vendor finance. Who's heard of vendor finance? Okay, vendor finance. For, for everybody in the audience who's got um, literally no deposit, this is another way that you can get started. So what you do is you go to a vendor... <coughs> Just flip those up. Yep. You go to a vendor. Let's say you want to buy a house for three hundred thousand. That's what you're buying it for. What deposit do you need to put in? Sixty grand. 
which is basically 20%, 20% deposit, which is 60,000. Now, most people don't have 60,000 these days. Young people, how long does it take to save up 60,000? Years. So what you basically say to a vendor with fina vendor finance is, is the, look, you go in and you say, look, I can give you 80%. I'm willing to buy your house at 300,000. I'm willing to pay you a slight premium for your house. Maybe you say, I'm willing to give you 305, 5,000 more than what you're asking. But what I need you to do is I can give you 80% of the money now and I need you to leave 20% in the deal and I give that to you basically in three months time, six months time, 12 months time, whatever it may be. Vendor finance is a big strategy used by property developers where they basically, what they're doing is they're not putting in a deposit. At that stays with the vendor and then once the deal is done, they get repaid straight after that. So what you can do as renovators, you just say, um, I'd like to give you 80% and I will pay you the remaining 20% in approximately three months time. So if you're buying again, if you're buying a property, you're buying here, it's one, two, three, you know, three months, four months, let's say three months, and you're doing a cosmetic reno, six weeks, you get the property revalued here, and basically you're paying them here. So you're only chucking in 240,000 here, obviously funding your renovation costs through here, and basically you're paying them out here. Does that make sense or do you need me to explain it? Okay, cool. So vendor finance is a very good thing. You just got to ask the questions, okay? Now, when you're, where find vendor finance is particularly good is um, just sites that aren't selling for any particular reason. Sometimes you can go in and buy sites and, and put a different spin on them and make them more appealing than what they are. So just got to ask those questions, vendor finance. So the best conditions, for, so the main conditions that you're going to negotiate as a professional renovator are minimal to no deposit, extended settlement, immediate access prior to settlement. You also want to get immediate consultant access. So you want, your, you want to basically negotiate that you can get your surveyor, your architect or your draftsman in. And that's pretty much it, okay? So most real estate agents are more than happy to let those consultants in. Um, and also your vendor's approval to get a development application lodged. Now, don't wait until you settle to get your DA lodged. There is a template within your manuals at the back of section five, which is called a letter of authority. It's basically this template here. Oops, I haven't got it here. Um, it's basically a one pager, which the vendor signs and they lodge that into council. So when, because you're not the income, because you don't technically own the property, you just can't go and lodge a development application willy-nilly on somebody else's property. So there's a template there that you sign and when you lodge your development application, that is lodged with your DA and that will allow you basically to get that development application process done before you settle. Okay, obviously subject to finance approval and pest inspection as well. Okay, I want you to think, I want to show you some strategies how you can think outside the square with little to no money. I presume most of you will be interested in this. Okay, first of all, a very simple strategy, borrow money from your family and friends. I know you think, you got, you got no friends with, no family or friends with money? Okay, so um, I did this in very first year with Steve's mum. Uh, we had renovation projects on the go, did six renos in my very first year, and obviously I didn't have enough money to fund all of those. So I actually went to Steve's parents. Look, they owned a, a house in Blacktown, a $340,000 house. It's a, a normal project home and uh, they didn't owe any money on it. So we went to them and said, look, is it possible that we can get a no-doc loan? We'd thrown in our jobs, so we couldn't substantiate our income. So we all, you know, as renovators, you're gonna be relying on no-doc loans and low-doc loans, that's the reality. So we'd thrown in our jobs. We said, look, we can't, um, we've got all our cash tied up in other projects. We don't have, technically have jobs, so we need to go down a no-doc path. Can we get a no-doc loan against your property? So I don't, at the time, in all honesty, I don't think she really knew what she was signing. But we got a, um, uh, it sounded good though. And so <laughs> uh, we went and got a no-doc loan against her house. So she said, yeah, that's no problem. I want to help you. Went and got a no-doc loan. So we took the no-doc loan. She was a pensioner. She couldn't substantiate it, so I had to go down the no part. So $340,000 house, I think we got a line of credit for somewhere. It was like two seventy, two hundred and eighty thousand that we had a kitty to play with. So that was one of the ways that we actually did a deal in our very first workshop. It's one way that my student from Wagga that I keep referring to, how she did her very first deal. Her mother lent her $40,000. So it doesn't, you know, you don't need to go and mortgage your family home to the hilt, even if they take just a little portion of equity. Most parents 
parents would be willing to help their children in that regard. The parents in the audience, would you be willing to help your children try and get them a, get them a start if you had some equity? I think most, maybe not. <laughs> you want to kill your kids? <laughs> um, I'm sure I'll be having that problem in about 15 years. Um, so most parents will help you, their kids in that regard. Now you don't go to mum and dad or you don't go, so actually a lot of my students have actually, uh, particularly the younger students, have gone to like their siblings, their older sister, older brother who's working, who's got a little bit of equity behind them. So don't always think about, you know, um, trying to get money from mum and dad. It's even just your family members, aunties, uncles, um, even good friends, best friends, but just be careful who you do business with. Um, so with, with uh, family and friends, w what you don't do is you don't go to mum and dad and go, hey, mum, dad, I've been to this renovating course and I you know, really want to do this renovating thing and um, how about lending me 50G, all right? You don't go to them like that. You go to them, you go to them with your due diligence system. You go to them with your... <clears throat> so you go to them with your due diligence system. You say, mum and dad or, you know, Susie, whatever her name, or your sister's name, whatever, whoever is, it is, you go to them, look, I've been studying my, these target suburbs for the last 12 weeks. I've put together a proper due diligence system. I've been monitoring all the prices. I know that two-bedroom houses sell in this area for three to 360000 Four-bedders sell from three sixty to four twenty. Uh, look, I've done my numbers. I found this project deal. I've actually done a financial feasibility. It's stacking up. I've done all these other little calculators, your resale calculators, blah, blah, blah. Um, I've actually done this deal and it's actually stacking up as a renovation deal and I can get in and do a quick cosmetic renovation, get it sold, this money paid back to you within three months. Would you potentially be interested in lending me some money or would you even be potentially be interested in doing this project deal with me? <laughs> so can you see how there's a way of pitching it? When they see all this stuff that you're going to take home and basically when you start to use these tools, they are going to see that you're trying to do this in a professional capacity, not as some, you know, as a wafty. So approach that in the right way. So with Steve's mum, what we did is we obviously borrowed that money. So we did the reno. We got it paid back very, very quickly. And then one day we went over her house for lunch one Sunday afternoon. We actually took a big bag of money, um, basically in like one of those bank bags. We made sure it was all in $20 notes so it looked like a lot of money. Um, and basically we like went to her house for lunch and we like, just dropped it on the, on the dining table and she said, what's that? We said, look in the bag. And she opened the bag and she was like, whoo, <laughs> like that. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> she was like, what's that, what's that? And we said, that's for you. And she goes, well, what is that for? And uh, she's German, she's, you know. Um, and, uh, and we said, that's our, that's sh we said, you lent us that money and that's our way of saying thank you. We made really good money on that project that you helped us get and that's our way of saying thank you. It was, um, I think it was seven or $8,000 cash in a bag. And she thought all her Christmases had come at once because she's used to getting, I don't know, how much do you get paid on the pension these days? Not a lot, 200 bucks? a fortnight or something or a week or whatever but she had literally got like two years pension and her eyes she did nothing she signed a signature like I said I don't think she realized what she was doing but she thought she was keen to sign a signature anyway from that point of view and it was funny because um even like even up to like a year ago she was still saying to Steve and I would you like to borrow some money <laughs> And so she doesn't, she just thinks, you know, we go on holiday a lot. So um, she has no idea, she has absolutely no idea what we've been doing for the last 10, 11 years. So um, once you get them on side, so, you know, you've got to incentivize people, your family and friends. So even, you know, uh, mums and dads, whatever, you can even involve them in the deal. And it's actually a really nice thing. When you're dealing these deals with family members, it's actually a really nice way to actually bond together as a family and sort of even enhance relationships. Hopefully, all right, <laughs> okay, <laughs> all right. I've actually got quite a lot of students, or not quite a lot, but I've got quite a number of students, um, mother and daughter, Renault teams and things like that, um, and dad and daughter, Renault teams. So really nice, you know, sort of family. You know, I've got one family in Sydney who mum, dad and their two children are now renovating together as a family. So it can be nice if you can manage that sort of stuff. Okay, property syndicates. If you might have only a little bit of money yourself, who's here say, um, is happy to admit they've only got a little bit of money to start with? Okay, so look around. Okay, so that's quite a lot of people. So, you know, 
pull together your resources. This, this room is a perfect opportunity for people, like-minded people who have the same um, amount of training. So if you've only got a little bit of money and struggling to find a deal, join forces, join a property syndicate with a number of people where you can contribute your funds and your skills and your time and your resources together. So they can be great ones. But as I said, just make sure you are be, be careful who you do business with. You don't want to be doing business with people who are indecisive and chop and change their mind every five minutes they're white one moment and blue the next you don't want to be dealing with those sorts of persons so keep common sense and you want to deal with people who are reasonably professional and have the same vision as you okay spotters fees I know a lot of you are interested in spotters free fees okay so what a spotters fee is I've got a lot of students doing spotters fee if you've got absolutely no money or literally no money to do any renovation deals what you should be seriously doing is a spotters fee and what a spotters fee is is you basically get paid a fee for doing all the due diligence for somebody else are there a lot of lazy people around do you think a lot of people could be bothered going through the open for inspections for 12 weeks to become an expert? <laughs> Absolutely not. There's people that just won't do it. I'm unfortunately in that category these days where unfortunately I'm sort of uh, speaking most Saturdays somewhere around Australia. So I find it extremely difficult to be basically be traipsing through the open for inspections right now. I'm looking to buy another two or three properties this year to have more structural renovations on the go because I love renovating. But I find it extremely hard to actually get through the open for inspections with my work commitments and speaking commitments. So I will actually pay any of you in this room who are looking in Balmain, Roselle, Lily, Field, I will more than happy to pay you a fifteen, twenty thousand dollars spotters fee to bring me a good deal off the market. So there's an opportunity straight off the bat for you, straight away. So what it is with spotters fees, um, <clears throat> and it's not just me. There are lots of people around who will pay you for these sorts of things. Uh, I've got one student in Sydney who's making an absolute mozza just from doing spotters fees. When she signs a spotters fee, she also um, gets the person for project management fees as well. So what it is, it can be an unrenovated property, it can be a property that's on the market, it can be a property that's off the market. So most people think they can't get a spotters fee for a property that's actually publicly advertised, but you can in fact, my student who's um, making an absolute mozza, most of the properties are on the market. So what she's doing is she's just making people aware and she's doing the report as to what the property, what potential the property offers. Um, who, who are all the Think and Go Rich customers, students? By the way, Stuart Zadell says hello and um, hope all of you are having a good time from him. He asked me to pass a message on. Um, so basically, um, you know, he paid one of my students $20,000 for, sorry, $15,000 for a property that was publicly listed on the market, but she did the due diligence for him because he was a time poor professional as well. So what you do is you find an unrenovated property you take it to a willing buyer. Now, first of all, you've got to produce this report, okay? So I'll just I'll pull up the steps here. So you produce this report. Now, this report is just basically a <coughs> another template that it has. The first section is just the details about the property. So you know, you go out. So you're obviously going to have to go inspect the property, take a few images. You basically pull like an information sheet: the land size, the zoning, just all the general sort of stuff. The land size, the house size, the council, the land use, the build date, the type of transaction. Is it on market, off market, whatever it may be? You basically then have an overview of the property. So this is where RP data is particularly good because you can actually pull out like the aerial maps, or you can use those, you know, the UBD city street map that I showed you on day one, um, those sorts of things. So you're just pulling together like an information blurb on the actual property. The second section is a property overview. So it, it contains um, the agent's brochure. It contains anything about the actual property um, images. So it's very similar to the finance proposal um, where you're just go basically going through and doing that. Your sec uh, third section is your suburb due diligence. So this report looks like a fairly mean report, right? But what it is, it's just actually pulling in a lot of the checklist from the system that you're going to have to do anyway in step number two. And that's why I'm saying you only have to do those checklists in step number two literally once 
and then you're gonna they're gonna feed into different things that you're going to need. So you tick, 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 all of the suburb due diligence, you know, that's where you come back with your five minutes, you put all the pretty pictures of the cafes and the parks and the water, whatever it may be, is in that's in your suburb. You then you've got your property due diligence checklist, so you go through that. Any other details about the property, um, you do your property inspection checklist so they can see you've gone through and looked at absolutely everything. You've accounted for the light switch on the wall, you've identified what needs to be repaired. You then go through, um, at the back there's a section called project viability. Now this is where you're going to put your, you know, your little calculators, your resale calculator, your floor to space ratio calculator, you're going to put your financial feasibility um, that you've crunched the numbers on and then right the very last section is the project recommendation section and that's basically your formal offer template with what offers you're um, basically proposing and at the end of this report it says should you buy this property I'm asking for a spotter's fee of X amount. If it's say a 300, let's say it's a $300,000 house, it's a quick cosmetic reno that somebody's going to make 60 grand on, a fair spotter's fee would be like three, three to four thousand dollars. So it's always, the spotter's fee is always based on the profit margin, not the purchase price. The more profit margin, the better. So in Stuart Zadell's case, Helen bought, um, Stuart paid nine, 975 for his property and there was, there was almost 300, I think it was $300,000 profit in the deal. He's obviously got capital growth, so it'll end up being a half a million dollar deal for him uh, by the end of the year when he's finished. But 975 showing a 300 grand and she paid a 15K, she was paid a $15,000 spotter's fee. Okay, so obviously the lower the profit, the lower the spotter's fee. What you do, so you bind that report up. As I said, it looks mean, but all the, you know, the templates are there. Um, so you have to pull it together. And you can certainly start doing like the suburb due diligence stuff now and getting some of that stuff done. So you bind it up, you take it to Officeworks and you get it bound up. And what you do is you find somebody who potentially would be interested in buying that. So I guarantee you, like even just people at your work or your neighbours or your family, your friends, if I went to you and said... Uh, Graham, Tim? Graham, Graham yeah. Um, if I said, Graham, I've actually, I'm, you know, I'm a professional investor. I've actually found this deal, this property. Look, I, I don't, I'm not in a position to be able to buy it myself, but I've done the formal due diligence on the property. It's a quick cosmetic renovation showing a $60,000 profit margin. I've done all the property due diligence. It stacks up from the numbers, from the resale price. I've done a, a complete viability of the project. I'm actually asking, I'm going to leave this report with you tonight. If you want to read through, it will tell you absolutely everything about the property that you need to know. I'm going to leave this with you tonight. If you're, it's a property that's advertised on the market. If you're interested in buying it, I'm asking for a spotter's fee of $3,000 in return for doing the due diligence and bringing this deal to you. Are you interested, Graham? Okay, that's all you need to do. Okay, who in the room, if I came to you and said it like that, who would be interested? Most people. You'd be crazy not to. So spotters fees are an absolute great way to get a start in renovating if you've actually got no money because there are a lot of lazy people. They will pay you to do all of that for you. You need to make sure that report covers everything. They pay you. So as soon as they sign the contract, so they'll enter into contract. So you can help them negotiate with it, like whatever it takes to get it across the line. Um, as soon as they sign the contract, they pay you the spotter's fee at the exchange of contract. And that says that in the manual. Now, some people, there's no legal agreement for that. It is an honesty system. So if Graham said, yeah, sure, I'm going to go and buy that, and Graham went and undercut me, there's really not much you can do about that. But I know what, me and you are never going to be doing business again. So most people do the right thing by people generally. Would you agree with that? Yeah. Doesn't always happen. Uh, Sheree, um, I reckon that it may take some time for the person you're talking to to put the finances together or just to think about it and make the decision. How do you, or in your, in your experience, secure the property? Because someone else can come yep. and buy that from... Yeah, and you've got to tell them, you've got to act quick. So you, it's basically the, the time pressure. So, and that's the thing, if you do that report properly, they've got it all there. It only take them like an hour or two to read through the property. They'll still want to go and inspect the property, but um, you have to just say, look, this is not going to last. You need to act quickly. It's like, you know, with Stuart Zadell, 
Um, he had less than 24 hours. He, the deal got brought to him on a Wednesday afternoon. The contract will sign 11 or 12 o'clock the very next morning. So went out, had a look at the deal, made a decision, lawyer out in sight the next day. So if you've got a really good deal, people will jump. It's not every day somebody says, hey, there's a structural reno showing 268K profit margin. So people will jump when they need to. Okay. Yes. Brie, as a spotter, how do you find your clients? Do you advertise? No, just, um, just normal people, uh, consultants, um, like people you deal with, family, friends, neighbours, um, anybody. Yep. Okay. Um, the good thing for you is that as graduates, when the new forum's up in a couple of weeks, um, you can actually post spotters' fees. on. There's actually a section there for spotters' fees. So you can actually just now do this and, um, yeah, post away. So keep an eye on that, guys, because uh, it could be potential deals for you. All right. These are two little semis. A lot of you would have seen these in the recent site tour that I did, uh, the two little semis in Cameron Street. So I got paid a $40,000 spotter's fees for these two little um, semis, and I did this in my first, I think it was my first year, or at the end of my first year. So I, the, the lady originally wanted a million dollars. It was one owner, two separate titles for the semis. Um, I never wanted to buy two. I was in a position to buy both, but I really didn't want to. So I said to the agent, I'll take both of them. Um, I negotiated a $40,000 discount because of the building defects. So I ended up picking them up for nine sixty. So I said to the agent, I'm going to put one of the semis in one company name and the other will be in a different name. So I already gave her the heads up that was going to be the case. She's like, yeah, no problem, whatever. And uh, as soon as she's, we did that deal, we agreed the deal. So I'd only agreed to buy them. So, you know, obviously when somebody says, yeah, I'm going to buy them, um, you know, we're doing the deal with you. It normally takes a couple of days to get the legal contracts exchanged, whatever it may be. So as soon as we agreed the deal, I jumped straight onto the phone to a builder that I knew in the area. I said, look, I've just secured these two, um, two one-bedroom semis. I'm going to take one. Do you want to take the other one? The other one has upside. You can put a first floor extension so it can be a structural. And he was a builder. So he said, yeah, no problem. So he drove past, didn't even go through them, drove past and he paid me a $40,000 spotter's fee. Now looking back, that was an incredible amount of money to get. I got lucky on that one. Um, that probably should have only been a five, ten thousand dollars $10,000 spotter's fee. But, um, you know, one phone call, 40 grand. It was a nice day. Nice day's work. Okay, trade your time and skills for a profit share. I'll just pull up the steps for you. Now, what this is, this is like a project management um, arrangement where some people have got houses, unrenovated houses, that they don't have the skill to renovate themselves. They don't have the patience, the time, or just the inclination to do it themselves. So you can go in as professional renovators and actually do it for them. So what you're in effect doing is you're trading your time and your skill for a profit share. So what you do is you find an owner or just find anybody. There's a lot of vacant houses around in, the, in suburbs. Not until you start looking that you actually become aware of vacant houses sitting around. Um, any, anybody that's got an old rental like a rental property that's starting to become a little bit tired and a little bit more troublesome to rent out. Um, so there's all these sorts of peoples uh, that can basically do these deals. Um, you can even go to these people and so they don't even have to own own property. You could go to like your accountant or your lawyer or bank manager or anything, your plastic surgeon, whoever it may be, okay, your accountant, whoever. You can go to them and say, look, um, I want to buy this property. I don't have the money to fund it. I have the time, the skill, the intellectual property knowledge, but I'm short of funds. So would you like to do a joint venture together? Would you like to do a deal together where you fund it and I get in, I project manage the whole site for you? So you're trading your time and skills for profit share. So I did this deal just uh, last year. Um, this was a big house that I did at number 20, uh, 24 Church Street, Pimble. Yeah, 24. I forget. There's so many numbers now. 24 Church Street, Pimble. So I had this guy come up to me and say, look, um, he had a, this was a rental property that uh, he didn't have any time to renovate himself. He said, Sheree, I know you renovate houses. I know it's not in your target area, but um, you know this house nearly, really needs to be rented out and I don't have time to do it and I just don't want to do it. Um, he basically lived on a plane commuting back from Australia to China all the time. So I actually agreed to do it. So this was a big renovation. And it took seven or eight months, so it was a 450 square metre house. So what we did is we did a deal together where the house was um, valued at 1.4 million before the renovation started, okay? And then we had a legal contract in place, which you have on your legal contracts disc. He funded the whole renovation in its entirety, so 780,000 that I spent on this particular renovation, so that was, you know, quite a big reno. 
The total project costs were $2.18 million and the value, the property got valued by the same valuer at the end and it was valued at 3.1. I couldn't help myself. I got all the real estate agents out to see what it was worth and they all said in somewhere between 3.3 to sort of 3.45 million was the general range that the agent said. But my legal agreement said the basis for the calculation would be the valuer that originally valued it. And that came in at 3.1. So through my time, my skill, my intellectual property knowledge as a renovator, I added 920000 thousand dollars incremental value so that was the value on top of all the project cost okay and I got a 50% slice share of that so I'm, I got a check for 460,000 basically that was drawn down to me over the course of those seven months and basically um, what happened was um, I didn't I didn't didn't contribute one dollar I just contributed my time, my skill, my intellectual property knowledge. So those arrangements can be whatever you want. In most of those arrangements, you will get paid right at the very end. Okay, so uh, it was just my deal because I guess because of my experience, I could draw down some things. But um, it can be really be whatever you want. Now, if I was contributing some money to that project, that is not a straight 50-50 profit share. So when you're doing joint venture arrangements, the first question you've got to ask is who is contributing what? What is each party contributing? In this case, uh, this person was contributing all the funding, who's contributing the property and the funding, and I as the renovation was contributing my time, my skill, intellectual property knowledge. So that was a straight 50-50. If I was contributing money and doing all the work, it might be 40-60. If I was contributing a larger chunk of money, then it might be like 20-80, whatever it may be. So you work out what the contribution is on each party. Yep. Um, you were saying before about doing the project management and you draw down like a a wage, I suppose, for a bit of... I was only able to do that because of my experience. He knew that I was a professional renovator. But w all of you walking out of the room probably won't be able to do that straight. You'll get paid at the end. Because they may not... People will have... Will be not, because you're inexperienced, um, people may not know whether or not you're going to add, truly add value to the property. So I could just get away with it because I've got a track record. Um, but most of you will get paid at the end. That was my condition because I really didn't want to do the reno. It was a, it was a pain in the butt travelling to, to Pimble every day, an hour in the traffic, an hour back. So I really didn't want to do it. But for me to make half a mil and not outlay a dollar was okay. <laughs> I got motivated to get out of bed. <laughs> Um, Cherie, you've gone with about a 55% reno cost. On what basis did you determine to go so high relative to, say, a 40% that you're giving us as a measure? Uh, it was just him. It was his variation. So he up, he up specced everything. So he just wanted, you know, crystal chandeliers and all sorts of things. And I didn't care because it wasn't my money. Yep. Any other questions? No, good. All right. Vendor finance. So, okay, vendor finance is another great way to get started in renovating with absolutely no money. So, just make sure you choose your words carefully. I can give you 80% now. Where's that 80% coming from? The bank, okay? I can give you 80% now. Can you wait 12 weeks for me to give you the remaining? Or can you wait an extra six weeks on top of settlement for me to give you the remaining 20%? So you don't go to them and go, hey, can you give me vendor finance? Like you don't go to Nanny and Poppy and say, can you give me vendor finance? They're going to go, what? What's that, love? Um, so you just go, can I give you 80% now? I'll give you 20% at the balance. Okay. So there's lots of notes in your, like read through your manuals because there's lots of self-explanatory notes on this regard. Vendor rebates, who's heard of those? Mm. I got told to drop this from my workshop. Do you think I did? No. Okay. Um, vendor rebates. What's that? Sort of. Okay, yeah, I, I got told to drop this from my workshop purely for the reason that um, I think vendor rebates will probably become illegal at some point in time. They are legal right now, okay, and I've certainly been able to do some deals from vendor rebates. I always get this mixed up, the calculations, but I'll try and not and, uh, mess it up today. So what it is, is uh, and I'm just, the easiest way for me to explain this is if I actually draw it on the, on the board and give you the real life example where I was able to do this. I bought two blocks of land at um, two oceanfront blocks of land in Maroubra at Little Bay uh, with the old Prince, on the old Prince Henry Hospital site. 
one, and I'll just use the example. So I bought two of them. They're expensive blocks of land, 450 square meters, $1.85 million each. Um, so expensive blocks of land for a little bit of chunk of land that they were, but nice part of the world. So I'll just do the example on one of the blocks so I don't have to confuse you all. One of the blocks, the, um, it was Landcom, the government developer. So it was a government developer that I did this, highly legal. And they were asking $1.85 million. I only wanted to pay them $1.75 million for the actual land. So what they said to me is they said, um, OK, that's fine. We're going to give you, you can buy the block of land for $1.75 million. But what we want to do is on the contract of sale, we want to put on the contract of sale that you're purchasing the block of land for $1.85 million. Okay, so the contract was 1.85 million, but within the contract, there is a clause that says, on settlement, you will be rebated back a check of how much? $100,000. So they call it simultaneous settlement. It's basically where my solicitor gives them a check for, they say they're all in the room together. My, check gives, my solicitor gives the vendor a check for, one, Landcom a check for 1.85 million. They stamp it. Settled, now mine, yippee. And then basically uh, at the very same time, like literally like half a minute, one minute later, then Landcom goes, here's a check to my solicitor for $100,000 and that's done. That's called simultaneous. So it's just around, it's like a few people standing in a room, they pass the checks to each other and it's done. So what they did is they rebated me ch uh, back a check uh, of $100,000 on settlement. Now the downside of this is that I'm paying stamp duty on how much? One point, so I had to pay a little bit of extra stamp duty. You can negotiate. You say, well, I'm going to be, I'm going to be down um, 1,600 in extra stamp duty, so I want you to reduce the price down from 1.75 less one point. So you can actually negotiate that into your contract. So what happens is the reason why they do this, and this is why you've got to be so careful. There's so many sneaky tactics out there in the real estate world. When people on RP data, guess what it gets reported as? 1.85 million. So when unsuspecting Joe and Sally or, you know, Lucy and Tom come through and they say to these big developers of these big estates, what did, um, what did lot number 10 sell for? What are they going to say to them? 1.85 million. Really, they sold it for 1.75 million because most people don't know about vendor rebates within the contract of sale. Now, where this is becomes an ethical issue, if you want to call it that, is that, and the problem in the past, is that the bank only gets the front page of the contract of sale. They don't get all the other stuff in between. So the contract, the clause saying 100 grand is in all the paperwork underlying that front cover. So the banks don't often know about it. So it's become a bit of an issue in that regard. So do you all understand that at that point? Now, how can this be beneficial to you as renovators? Let's say, yeah, it's, it's actually one way for you to put um, less deposit in the deal. Sorry, Helen, I should have. Let's say you want to buy a house for 500000 Normal scenario. You're chucking in 20% deposit, deposit, just assume you're not doing any creative low doc, no doc, whatever deal. You're chucking in 20% deposit, which means you need a deposit of $100,000. Is that correct? Yep. And the bank is going to lend you 400 k If you can go into a vendor, let's say an unrenovated property comes on the market. If you go to a vendor and say, yes, I'm actually interested in buying your property, I will buy it for 500000 Is it possible that on the contract of sale, you can put the purchase price as $550,000? And I have a condition within the contract that says I'm going to rebate you back $50,000 on settlement. So you need to explain to them, we settle, and then my solicitor is going to, at straight at the same time, give you back another check. So I'm giving you 500000 but on the contract, I need you to state it as, fi as, fi as 550000 You're going to get $50,000 rebate. Now, what amount is the bank going to lend you on? What's 80% of 550000 440,000 the bank is going to lend you. So bank lend. 440,000. 
You're chucking in a deposit of how much? 60000 you only You're only buying the property... You're only buying the property for 500000 You see that? So you automatically, instead of having to save, how long does it take you to save $40,000? Maybe another two years? So that's one way you can actually get into a property. So it's not a totally money-free strategy, but you know, obviously the more expensive the property, that could be different. So in one scenario, if you do a normal contract with no funny terms or conditions, in this scenario, you'd be chucking in a $100,000 deposit, or if you can get the vendor to agree to a vendor rebate, you only have to chuck in $60,000. That's where you might have enough money to actually even fund the renovation. That $40,000 you save could actually fund the renovation. Yeah, so it's the 60 here. Yeah. Oh, 50 million? Yeah, it's an expensive house, that one. Does that make sense? You have a question? Uh, hi, Sheree. Um, what if the bank doesn't value the property at 550? Okay, so this is, this is part of your prop, your good question. I don't know, I forgot to mention that today. So this now relies on the bank bringing the valuation. Now, some banks will actually take the price, uh, the contract price. Um, some banks will send out their own, all banks will send out a valuer, but this is where your valuer due diligence reports come in, so I'm about to explain those to you. So your objective is to get your valuation as close as possible to that figure. All right? Okay. Um, did you find that useful? Yeah. Glad I didn't take it out. Okay. All right, joint ventures. So we've spoken about joint ventures. Basically, joint ventures are when you're doing a property deal with a number, either one or more parties, okay? So there are joint venture agreements contained in your legal contracts disc. Okay, so just when you are doing a joint venture, look, a joint venture can be anything. It can be any deal, any way, any shape or form. Whatever you agree between the parties, so you might have two people, two strangers or just two unrelated people come and buy a property together, you work out who's going to do what, that all needs to be clearly documented on a legal agreement. Please don't ever sign these legal agreements until you have read through every single line of fine print in those terms and conditions, okay? And you should make sure that the other person that you are going into business with in terms of the joint venture, you should basically say to them as well, make sure you read through everything think and don't sign it until you understand everything because the last thing you want to be doing is a joint venture like some of you will probably do a joint venture in this room together but you need to go into that joint venture 100% knowing what you are entering into and what the expectations are on each of the parties in that agreement the hello <laughs> just going back to the the valuations yep. what's your experience typically like are you finding that valuers generally are being conservative because they're acting on behalf of the banks and are, yep. you know, 20% or 10% oh, like under? Oh, absolutely. In, in you know, tighter economic times like now, yeah, obviously they are a little you bit are. more conservative. But my, 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 I'm about to show you my valuers report, so um, there's some ways around that, mm. absolutely. Mm -hmm. So I'll go through that shortly. Okay. All right, um, strategy eight, find time for, for professionals willing to pay you a project management fee. I've got quite a number of students now who are just going as stepping out from this course who are now becoming just project managers, renovating other people's houses for them. So if you don't have enough money to start in your own renovation, project manage somebody else's for them and just charge a basic project management fee. Okay, get credit cards. That's another way that over people overlook in terms of getting started. So short-term debt, just make sure that short-term credit card debt doesn't become long-term credit card debt, okay, because the fees become quite exorbitant. All right, upsell value. Upsell valuers. So I'm going to show you now my valuation strategy. All right. Before I do that, I want to hand out your legal contracts disc. So all the single people... <laughs> I did it again. <laughs> Single attendees. Um, yes. Has everybody got a yellow dot? I don't think people got a yellow dot. Yep. Yeah, they have. Okay, everybody with a yellow dot.
You just base it on the read value. Yeah. So the question there is if you're holding, if the person that you're renovating the house for holds it, how do you determine the valuation? It's just basically revalued and the properties, your project management fee is paid based on the new value. All right. <laughs> Take a quick question there while we're waiting. Is there a microphone there? Thank you. Sorry, I think I missed something. You said 20% um, project management. 15, 15 to 20%. It could be whatever. What? Like you might be willing to work for it. Just for me, it'd be like 15, 20% of the profit margin. Of the profit. Yeah. Um, now on your legal, uh, no, it's not spotter's fee. That's different. That's project management fee. Yep. Spotter's fee is about uh, five, three to 5% of the profit margin. Yep. Um, on your legal contracts disc, you have a number of legal agreements. You've got your early access agreement on that disc. You've also got uh, two different versions of joint venture agreements, so you can now start going out and doing deals with other people. You've also got uh, some option agreements as well. So uh, option agreements are property development sort of land. Um, in fact, I think I skipped that somewhere. Um, I'll tell you what options, does everybody know what options are? Okay, what options are very commonly used uh, for big developers, small, medium, large developers? And what an option is a right to own a property? So it is somewhere in your manuals. It is a right to own a property. So for example, if I wanted to go and buy somebody's house, uh, let's say it's a development site, you know, options are great if, you're, if you can get multiple sites. I know there's somebody in the room that has multiple sites at the moment. So let's say uh, you've got a house here. Let's say you've got three houses there and you go to a person, you know, it could even be just two, two sites, whatever it may be. You go to a person, you go to these owners, and you say, look, I, is it, I'd like to buy your property. Would you be willing to give me an option over your property? What an option is, is basically um, a right to buy the property. Uh, you're taking control, but not ownership. So normally people negotiate like a one, big developers normally d negotiate like a 12 month option, like a one year, a two year, a three year, depending on what it might be. So they look at the whole process of how long it takes going to get DA approval, construction time, right through to that whole resale. So they work out the time factor, the length of the option, according to how long the whole process is going to take them from start to finish. Now with an option, what you do, so you might go in, you might want to buy this house. This house they want 400, just a normal house in the outer metropolitan suburbs they want 400,000 for. What you do is you go in and you say, look, if you're willing to give me a 12-month option over your property, I will give you a 1% option fee. So 1% of 400,000 is $4,000. So they get paid a, a $4,000 fee up front. And basically the developer who's got the option can now put a development application through or they can basically start their investigations as to what they can do with the site. Now, so quite often you'll find developers will go in and they'll option up, they'll get options over all of these properties and that's where they can start to land bank. So they're not actually committing themselves to actually purchasing them should the development application get you know, knocked back, rejected. So if the DA gets rejected, they have the option, they, they basically have the right to terminate the option agreement, they walk away and they lose their 1% option fee that they've paid up front. Okay, so it's a really low risk strategy. Instead of committing yourself, let's say all of these properties are worth 400,000, instead of committing yourself to a purchase of 1.2 million for those three houses only to secure them, go through council and council says, no, I'm not gonna let you put 12 apartments on those three blocks of land. And then suddenly the developer is stuck with three plots of land that he, can't, he or she can't do anything with. So what it does, they can get in and buy these properties for 4,000, 8,000, pay $12,000 as option fees to secure all these properties under option. They put the development application through or the pre-DA, whatever it may be. And if it, if it gets approved, then they basically notify their solicitor and say, I'd like to exercise the option. I'd like to now settle on the properties. Okay. If it goes south and it doesn't get approved, they ring up their solicitor and say, we'd now like to terminate the option and they walk away from the deal. So you can also use this. It's going to be harder for you as renovators to do this on a single 
a single house with Nanny and Poppy. I've never used an option on a single unrenovated house, but I have actually used options in the past to base, from more of a property development perspective because you're going to come across, like it or not, in your search and your travels as a renovator, you're going to come across development sites. Okay, You're going to come across sites. I call them splitter blocks where basically... I'm um, sorry, Helen, if I can get rid of that. Um, you're going to come across blocks where... So I call them splitter blocks where you have an unrenovated house, just a normal house with a big backyard, you know, driveway down the side. What can you do there? Subdivide. Subdivide and actually build a house to the rear. And this is where RP data is great because you fly over and you can tell which sites are underutilised. So for me, that's, that's not a renovation deal. It is. It's, a, it's what I call a combo. It's a reno and development play in one. So you can come in. So you can, you can basically go to Nanny or Poppy or who, you know, Beryl, and she, she wants 500k for this house. So you go into Beryl and say, Beryl, is it possible? Look, um, and like sometimes, you know, be honest with them. Say, look, I'm thinking that um, I might want to redevelop your block of land. Can I get an option on your house? So I just have an option over your house for a 12-month period to see if I can do what I want to do as a developer to your land. Um, sorry, I wouldn't say the word developer. Do what I do to your land. And um, what I'll do is I'll give you $5,000 for the right to do that. And if you then, you then go through your pre-DA, your development application process. So in some in, in respects, when you do an option, you don't have to go through the whole DA process. You can just do a pre-DA. So a lot of developers, if they go to council and do the pre-DA process, which is the preliminary, preliminary assessment, um, if they get the green light, they might exercise the option at that point of view and at that point of time say, yes, I'm going to buy this land. So it just means that you can actually go. So in this case, you're going to be outlaying 5K getting some proper answers and then committing yourself to the purchase afterwards. So options are particularly good for that. All right. Valuation reports. There's lots of valuations. There's lots of notes in your manuals about the difference. So certainly read through those. But this is what I do. I've done this um, consistently with a lot of houses. I, I haven't been doing it so much these days because I keep a lot of properties that I renovate now. But basically, uh, in my early days, just an example, I purchased a particular property for 705000 Three days later, I had it revalued by the bank at 830000 I hadn't touched it. So I'd basically created 125000 in invisible equity. Same with this property. This one I purchased for 820000 um, I increased the valuation up an extra $84,000. Um, this one I negotiated four months extended settlement. So a month later, I had that additional equity, hadn't even touched the property yet. So how I've been able to do that is I, I pulled together what's called, I call a valuer's property and suburb due diligence report. Now the reality is this is probably going to take you half a day. It is a pain in the butt to do. The template is there for you. But the first thing I do is I list down every single feature and benefit of the property um, contained in that property. Um, and look, and the reality is, is that it's unrenovated, there's probably not going to be many, but I just talk about this, the, the type of property that it is and the location and blah, blah, blah. What I do is I also... Um, If sometimes I use this report as well, a lot of the time when I've, I'm getting it, the property revalued at the end of the renovation, that's where all the features and benefits are in the property. Because a valuer, like a value is not going to work when you've renovated a house and you're trying to get the valuation as high as possible so you can maximise your line of credit. Because when you renovate a house, you do, you've got to maximise. Remember I said, I said yesterday, you know, you have to get it revalued to the highest degree, like maximise your loans as fully as possible. So what you've got is you've just got a line of credit for a rainy day. If a deal comes up tomorrow, you can pull 50, 100 grand, 200 grand out from that deposit and do the deal. That deposit's going to, I can have $200,000 deposit on your desk tomorrow morning, okay? So that's the sort of situation you want to be. You want to always have money at your disposal to do a deal whenever one pops up. So you should do this. Um, an aid, a valuer, when your house has been renovated, they're not going to know you've got underfloor heating. They're not going to know you spent $2,000 on that stone bath because most people don't put their sorts of things and most people just don't make their valuers aware. So um, you've got to point out all the features and benefits of the house, okay? Now, the time part of this, this report is what it's doing I rank, basically I rank the properties inferior properties and then I do similar properties and then I do superior properties. Now what I do is I list down the address, 
Uh, list the sales date, what date the property sold, the land size, the price, the number of bedrooms, bathrooms, car, um, the property condition, other comments, and I list a picture of the property. What I do in this report, I get all of this information from where? Oh, God, guys, you're killing me. Okay. <laughs> You get it from RP data and mainly your due diligence system, okay? So um, what you're doing, what you're doing, <laughs> what you're doing is um, what I do is the property. So what your aim with this object, what your aim with this report is, the inferior properties are property values that are similar to your value of your house. So for example, if your house is valued at six hundred thousand, I'll just use one of mine to be so I can get my head around it. A million dollars. Let's say your house, your renovated house is a million dollars. In your inferior properties, you want to be pulling out the properties around the one million dollar mark. And then your similar properties, you want properties sort of like around the maybe the you know the 1.1 to 1.2 million mark. And then superior properties would be sort of properties, you know, like around 1.1 to 1.3. Okay, so you're sort of like elevating them up a bit. What you do is you go to your property due diligence system, you start pulling out all the properties that are basically a higher price. Because you've got to remember that valuers, while they're not docile, they don't have all the pictures, they don't have the condition. Remember on your little sales template, it says the like sale comments. So here, quite often, the problem with valuers is they go back to RP data, they type on their computer and they just pull up properties and they have no idea what can Condition, whether they're on a sloping block, whether they had really was it you know off street parking or not really off street parking, they have no idea that 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 property that says it's a four bedroom property was really not a four bedroom property. It was really a three bedroom plus a tool shed. Um, so they don't know those sorts of details. So that's where your other comments come in play. So quite often I will do it, particularly as I said, I use this all the time in my early days where I'd rank these properties. So you you basically put it in this chart format. Okay, and then what you do is you actually photocopy the front and the back floor plan from each property that you put into this report. Okay, so you bind it all up. So I do that for inferior, I do that for similar. So basically what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to get the valuation up to make by explaining my comments so that they can see that what the figures that they're going to pull up from RP data aren't really um, necessarily, you know, truth. And what I do at the end is sometimes I get my, I'll, now when you've got good relationships with your agents, they'll actually give you appraisal letters. So I just ring Nicole, my agent, and say, Nicole, can you give me, uh, or Chris, can you give me a, um, just an appraisal, it's just for my, valuer, my valuer's report, can you just give me a letter telling me what the maximum price is that I could sell my property for? Okay, so they'll just give you a range. And if they like you and, and they know it's you know, not too severe, they'll give you a letter in that regard. Um, you know, rental assessment, so I get a rental appraisal done as well, saying what the property will rent for. And then I, I, at the back, I put in all those photocopies of the properties that I've pulled out of my due diligence report. Now this does take, at the very end, I say, I tell them basically who I am. I say, the owner of this property is a full-time property investor who specialises in property investment renovation and development days in this particular suburb. So I let them know I'm not some wafty who is just making this stuff up. Um, all, and then I also just compare brand new houses because your renovated house, while it's not a brand new house, it has brought up to almost brand new status. Brand new houses have a price premium um, as opposed to second-hand houses, that's reality. So I make them aware of the brand new sales in the area as well. And then at the very end, I say, based on the above sales evidence, I believe the subject property is an evaluation range of 1.7 to 1.9 million, okay? So I don't say, if, it, if this property is worth $1 million, I will say, I believe based on this evidence that the subject property is an evaluation price range of 1.05 to 1.11, you know, 115 million. I'll always bump it up an extra 100 grand because they're never going to like, probably very rarely going to bump it up to that figure. So you want to elevate, what you're trying to do is you're trying to elevate the price higher. Now the reality is no two properties are ever going to be the same. That's the reality. So it is sort of harder for them to determine what's fact from fiction. They will still do it in their number crummy. They're not going to give you a false valuation, but they will certainly take this into consideration. So I bind that up. As I said, it will take you half a day. It is, I'd hate doing this, but it's necessary. And what I do is when, I, when I'm organising the finance to my bank, I always say I must meet the valuer out on site. 
Okay, I must, because a lot of valuers just drive by. They don't know you've got a stone bath under floor heading. They don't know you've just gone through and renovated the whole house from start to finish. So they've got to meet you inside. So you have to be very specific about this and you have to say it three times to the bank because so many times I've said, I must meet the valuer on site and guess what? Bank rings you a couple of days later and says, oh, the valuer. And what's what happened to me on, my, on uh, one of my current projects? The bank said to me, property valuation came and I was waiting for the valuer to call me, a couple of days went past, bank rang me and said the valuation came in at 1.65 million for my current project and I said I haven't seen the valuer yet, I asked the bank to send the valuer out to me, I said send the valuer back around, they can't value the house by driving past it. So the valuer came out on site, came out with my report, I, now you don't go there to the valuer and the valuer comes out on site, you don't go, excuse me, um, you know, <coughs> This house has solid stone tiles and design above. They don't give a hoot, right? You just say, look, I've listed. So this is pretty much the conversation. They come out, be, always be extremely nice to your valuers. Take your due diligence system to your valuers and say, look, before they let say, look, I monitor this market very, very closely. I've got extensive due diligence libraries on every single property that has sold in this market. If you need any help with valuations, if you need to get a valuation from me, here's my card. Give me a call anytime. More than happy to help you. All right? That's how I had the valuers ringing me, not the agents. Because I knew I had better knowledge than the agents because I monitored all the properties on the market. So they come in your house, be very nice, you know, shake them hello. And um, say, look, I've just itemized, or I'm not going to say, look, I, I respect your time. I'm not going to go through everything. Um, I've just taken the liberty of itemizing all the features and benefits of the room so you can correctly place a value on them. What I've also done through my due diligence library, I've actually itemized all the similar properties for you. I've basically ranked properties in terms of similar, inferior and superior properties because I've, I monitor the market so thoroughly. I know what's apples to apples in my suburb. So I've done the report all for you. Um, I've given you an estimate of what I believe as a professional investor the property is worth. You'll certainly, um, you'll certainly do your own calculations, I'm sure, but I've just actually taken a little of um, help assisting you in uh, determining the value of this property based on my knowledge of the local area. So that's it, okay? Takes, it's like a three minute conversation. They'll go, okay, thanks. Like you'll get some real values, these values will like, you know, they'll, because some valuers will say, well, it's like almost like you're doing their job. So, and that's okay. So you just don't say, look, this is the valuation. You say, look, I'm just assisting, you know, assisting you, trying to assist you um, based on my knowledge of the local area. Because quite often they, these, you're going to have much better knowledge. You will have much better knowledge than the valuers. They're not out doing this every single day. So I do that. Now, just an example. So I came back, that valuer came back out on site, even on my current project. And that value, guess what the valuation came back in at? I think, it, sorry, they, they valued at 1.550 million and that valuation, like a five minute conversation on site with the valuer, the valuation came back in at 1.75 million. So, and I've done that consistently in my, um, as I said, I keep a lot of my properties these days, but um, it's one reason. So I created invisible equity um, just by doing those valuations. So what it meant was, Instead of putting, like if you look at that example, I think one of the properties was 736. I bought one of the properties in Smith Street, Balmain for 736, which would have meant that I would have had to have chucked in 20% deposit, which was 736 times 20%. So I would have had to have chucked in 147,200 deposit when the valuation, I think the valuation on that one came in at 825 just by doing those suburb due diligence reports. So instead of chucking in 147.2, I only had to chuck in 80%. Hang on. Uh, 80%. Well, 736 times 80%. So the bank was going to lend me 588, 800. And over here, the bank would lend me 5825 times 825 times 80%. They're going to lend me 660, but I'm only paying uh, minus 736. 736 minus 660. I'm only chucking in 76,000 deposit. So you can either pay 776,000 deposit or 147. What's your choice? So, like I said, it does take, it's, it's cumbersome, it's boring, um, but it takes you half a day, but is it worth doing? doesn't always go your way, it depends on the valuer, but if you can try and get into the habit of doing this, one of my students did this recently and was, was, was successful with this. Okay.
So you're saying that you've got a contract with the price of 736. Yes. Okay, and then when the value comes out, he will give you, he will value higher than that contract. Yes, yeah, so, and that's a good point. Mm. So there are only some banks. So when yeah. you're talking to your finance broker, either Paul or if you, you know, if you don't use Paul and you use your own, that's fine. But you need to find out which banks will take the, take, lend you on valuation price, not contract price. Yeah. Okay. Big difference there, okay? It's one of your questions from your mortgage broker, Paul, whoever it may be. All right, I'm going to keep moving. Okay, submitting your offer. Most people, when they're submitting an offer to a agent to buy a property, they pluck a figure out of the air, or they might, uh, you know, what most people typically, typically do when they're buying a property um, is they'll drive around the streets, they'll go to a few, a couple of weeks of open for inspections, they'll drive around the streets. Sorry, Jules, can I have my formal offer um, form, please? Um, they'll drive around the streets, they'll inspect properties for a couple of weeks, drive up and down the street, they might do some preliminary searches, give the legal contract to the solicitor, and that's pretty much the due diligence that they do. So basically um, what they do is when it comes time to actually submit an, an offer to the agent, they'll typically ring an agent and say, look, if it's a house that we're bidding on 600000 for, they'll say, look, I'll, I'll, I'm willing to put an offer in of 570 or 580. Everybody just naturally skimps. They try and get it 10, 20, 30 thousand dollars cheaper depending on the value of the property. So I don't like to submit my offers that way because basically you've got no leeway to negotiate your conditions as a renovator. Now as a renovator, we know we want minimal deposit, extended settlement, immediate access. They're the main three as a renovator, okay? Now if you go to Nicole, the real estate agent, and say, Nicole, I want to buy that house for 600000 but I want minimal deposit. I want to pay you know, only $5,000 deposit. I want 12 weeks extended settlement without, uh, instead of the normal six. And I want to try and get early access. What do you think Nicole's going to say? Yeah, right. Yeah, right. Exactly. So you're not even going to get past first base. So as a renovator, you've got to be smart about how you actually structure your offers. So I have, um, uh, the way that I structure my offers is I give the vendor a choice. Okay, most vendors, most people submitting an offer give their, make one offer. Would you say that's correct? Okay, so I give them a choice. I'm going to go through that. All right. So in your manuals, you've got three or four templates. You've got one, f you've got a template for just, thanks Jules. You've got this template here, which is if you want to submit just two offers. Okay, and these are all editable, so you can type in them, save them on your computer, and email them through to the agent. So you've got one for two offers, you've got one for three offers, and you've got one for four offers. Okay, so you just choose which one you want to do. Anybody looking at negotiating on a property right now, you want me to work this out for them in real life? Anybody? Yep. So I can have a microphone down here? Sorry, pillar. I think it's better if we work real examples. Probably learn better. Why are you doing that? So just tell me a little. I'm I'm not ignoring you. I'm multitasking. Um, so just tell me about the property while I'm writing this up. Uh, yeah, they're they're looking for offers over 1.2. Yep. And um, what is it? It's a five bedroom, two bathroom house. Whereabouts? In Hope Island. Hobart. Hope Hope Island. Hope Island. I was say, gee, that's expensive for Hobart. <laughs> What was it, half the country? <laughs> anyway. Uh, <laughs> all right. Okay, so Hope Island, whereabouts is that? Gold Coast. Oh, Gold Coast. Okay. So 1.2, so pretty pricey. It's on, yeah? a ca on a canal. Canal, okay. All right. So they want 1.2. How long has the property been on the market for? Three months, and it's a court, a divorce court order settlement thing. Okay, so divorce situation. All right. Anything else I need to know about it? Um, um, Reno uh, opportunity? What's the opportunity for you as a developer? Oh, yeah, it is a Reno opportunity, yes. All right, so what are you thinking, structural? No, cosmetic. Cosmetic, okay, cool. All right. And so what was your name? Shelley. Shelley. All right, so we know in Shelley's situation, she's looking at a house at 1.2 million purchase price. Well, that's what the vendor wants. It's been on the market three months, so it's fair to say, Shelley, that it's starting to become a little bit of a lemon. Yes. It's divorce. Oh, it's gone to auction too. Passed in an auction, beautiful. Now they're realistic. 
divorce, uh, cosmetic reno. Yep. And what do you think you can sell it for? <laughs> In this market? Oh, one point three. We were going to hold it though, so okay. I haven't given much thought to a sale price. All right. Let's assume we do four offers, okay? One, two, three, four. So this is offer one. So at this point, you don't know really what it's worth? No. Okay. All right. Um, with offer one, what I do is I always offer a lower price. So if they're wanting 1.2, how much do they get passed in an auction for? I don't know because we've only just walked into, into the so process. You need to try and find week. that out. Yep. Um, and you need to find out if what the last auction, whether it was a vend or bid. bid. Okay. So um, offer one for me is always a lower price. So if they're asking and they're sticking their heels in the ground that it's 1.2 they want, you know, I would make a low offer of like, one million. So we're going to put aside for the purposes at the moment what the true value is because we don't know at this point in time. But I would make an offer of 1.1, 1 .1, so 50,000. So your offer one is always below their, their, below their normal asking price. Deposit, you know, 5%. Deposit released, no. Settlement terms, uh, let's say 42 days. Let's actually, to keep it really easy, let's just go to 30 days. 30 days. Early access, no. So what you're saying is, I want to give you a lower price, but I want no conditions, okay? Early access. Subject to building and pest, yes. Subject to finance approval, yes. So you've got, would you agree you've got no quirky, that's just a normal transaction, no quirky conditions. All right, offer two might be... One point... One one nine zero deposit five percent deposit released yes settlement terms forty five days early access no subject to building subject to pest so what happens is as you work through this quite often you'll come back and you'll fudge figures you'll work out so don't expect to get this right first of all. One point, what do you think offer three is going to be? Yeah, 1.2. So the full purchase price that they're asking. Deposit, we might do say 3%. Deposit released, yes. Settlement terms, 60 days. Early access, no. Could go either way. So we'll come back to this. Subject to building and pest? Yes. Subject to finance? Yes. Okay, what's offer for? 1.215, for example. <laughs> Deposit? $5,000. Deposit released to vendor? Yes. Settlement terms? Could be, you know, 75 days. Don't, don't want to go too crazy. Early access, yes. Subject to building, yes, yes. All right. So what you do is and now you need to work out, I mean, because obviously you need to work out whatever figure you have over here, you've got to also work out what your holding costs are as well. So if the property is costing you, in this case, Shelley, on an, on an average, a 1.215 loan... Um, you're going to be chucking in 80%, so you're going to be borrowing 972. 972 times 8% interest is 77,000 a year, divide 12, uh, actually 77,000 divide 52 weeks of the year. So your weekly interest is 1,480. Now you're negotiating, let's say the standard time is 30 days, you get the first 30 days free, so you're actually getting an extra 45 days 
finance free, so to speak. So 45 divided 7 is what? How many weeks? Five, six weeks? Six weeks. So six. So, so that's six. Six weeks. So really your holding costs associated with that are 8,800. So see how we're a little bit above? We're actually paying double that. But on the flip side, you're actually getting early access to get the property revalued if money is tight. So basically what you do is you come through. So it's okay to sort of work back and fudge these figures according to where it sits. So in your case, you know, if you could um, get off it, what you're aiming for as renovators, you know, if you get the property at this, it's not the end of the world, you're still getting it under market value or under what they're asking. Um, you know, what you want to really aim for is to get offer three or offer, offer four. So I, I, I very rarely use offer two and I very rarely use off the three template one. I always submit my offers in, in terms of offer four. So what will happen is which, which price is the vendor going to naturally gravitate towards? Offer four. So what they're going to do is they're going to come along and they're going to go, I want 1.2. I can spend on the property for three months. They're getting no bites now. This, they're potentially becoming a desperate situation. They've also got divorce situation, which makes it even worse. So they're going to want money. One of the parties has moved out of home, probably cash. You know, reality is when couples break up, the guy normally gets kicked out in most cases, unfortunately. Sorry, fellas. Um, but the, the fella normally gets kicked out. And what happens is they've got to go then live somewhere else. So they've got to pay bonds somewhere else, buy furniture. So they can be quite cash trapped. So that's why release, releasing the deposit to the vendor, it can be quite good. So they're naturally going to want to gravitate towards here, to this figure right here, a price premium. And they'll say, what they'll say is, look, okay, yeah, deposit. Yeah, I can live with five... $5,000 deposit because in the contract it still says if you default they can come after you for the 10% anyway. So that deposit, that minimal deposit is never an issue. So I go, yeah, I want this price. I want this one. 5% deposit, yeah, I'm willing for that. That's no problem. The solicitors will say, yeah, that's no issue. You've got, in, you've got the 10% clause anyway. Deposit release, beautiful. Means, you know, Tom can go and pay a bond on somewhere else. Settlement term, 75 days. Hmm... It's a bit long, 75 days or what, two months, but you know what? It's been on the market for three months already, so if they get their money in another two months' time, they're probably just grateful to get a buyer rather than no buyers. So yeah, I can live with that, 75 days. Early access or oh, to renovate, oh, I don't really feel comfortable. They could get in and they could devalue our property. No, I don't feel comfortable with that. Now, some people go, yeah, get in. Renovate. It depends. If the younger vendor, they'll be more receptive to that. The older they, older the vendor, the harder for you to achieve that. So they might say, oh, no, I don't want that. You know, so they'll come back and they'll say, no, I want that price, but no early access. So if they don't want early access, then, then, then you say, well, that's offer free. So that's why you seem to be think that through. Okay, and that's why you, and sometimes you have to come back and you know, fudge that out and go, yeah, actually, I've got to give them, or no, I can't give them that. So you just got to sit there and think about it for five or 10 minutes. So they'll go, you know what, I don't want to give them early access. I don't feel comfortable. So maybe I can, if I, they, they give me full purchase price, only 3% deposit, I'm still happy to give them extended settlement of 60 days, a minimal deposit. There's no early access. I feel comfortable with that. So what it's doing, it's giving a vendor the choice to pick and choose which suits their needs. When you structure your offers in this regard, see how it's much easier to get your conditions over the line as a renovator, rather than just going, going. I'll give you 1.2 million, but I want early access, immediate extended, you know, early access, minimal deposit, extended settlement. I want this and that. So when you submit these offers, then you've got a much better chance of getting your deals across the line. Thank you. The bank's irrelevant. The bank doesn't make a decision. Okay, so then you start negotiating with the bank. The banks want to get the most... The banks want to get... I mean, they want to just pay out their debt. Yeah, they'll want their money sooner, which would be this one here, if the bank takes control of it. Yeah. But if the bank takes control, you'll probably get it much cheaper than $1.15 million. That's reality. All right, so... So if you can do that, so make sure you use those templates. So you email them through. You're going to email the template through with that. And what else? Your legal contract, the early access contract, and your 
public liability insurance. So they, they can allay any fears from the solicitor. So when it gets to the solicitors, they don't bump it on the head at that point. Okay. Sorry. It's probably a really stupid question, no? but with, um, with your templates, do we still need to also fill out the um, real estate's O&A forms as well? Because you know how they've probably got different clauses, yes. different sections. Yep. So, so Absolutely. I would technically then say, can I, I want to fill out four. Yes. Okay. Yep. You mean you in South Australia? WA. In WA, yeah. yeah. Yep. So there's different forms. So anything that's quirky in your state like that, then yeah, you'll have to fill out those forms in addition. Okay. So, but we can still hand in your template one. Yes. Yeah. And then the four. Yes. Okay. Thanks. Yep. All right. Question down there? Yeah. Gwen, um, would you not reduce the purchase price, give them a big fat deposit um, and get in earlier? Yep, it can, you know what, this can be, and this is why you have to know the situation of the vendor. So the first question I said, Shelley, what, tell me what's the situation here, what's the vendors? Because I know they're cash strapped with the divorce, um, so you can, you can, that's where you go back and you just fudge the figures. It can, those figures can be anything you want. So you just go back, you think, okay, put yourself in their shoes, what's going to be most appealing to them? Yeah. All right, we're going to break for, um, I'm going to take one quick question there and then we're going to take for, uh, get yeah. stuck into step number six. <coughs> Sheree, I just noticed that uh, quite often you see one of the conditions as subject to finance. Now I've read, I can't remember who it was, where a guy said it, the scenario was, you want to buy a house off, or you sign up for a house for me and you subject to finance as a clause and then you say, sorry, I can't buy it because the bank's knocked me back. Which, and we all know you can be creative there. Yep. I'll say, that's okay. I'll, lend, let, I'll supply finance at 20%. Now you're locked in. Is that... Have you ever heard of that? No. Who, who's offering that? Uh, I, the vendor. Uh, the vendor no. can say... No. Yeah, it's your choice. I mean, they don't, nobody else makes a decision as to your finance. You don't be locking yourself in with some shonky you know, financier that's going to charge you an exorbitant fee. So no, normally it's subject to um, finance, your finance approval. All right, set. Yep. Yep. All right, so we're going to talk about now step number six. Uh, sorry, one quick question there, and that's the last one before I move on. Otherwise, we're not going to finish today on time. Sh Sheree, in my um, previous, I've bought a few properties and developed yep. before. Good. Um, uh, a few of them have been at auction. Yes. And pro predominantly, I believe, all the properties I'm going to buy are at auction. Yes. Um, and I have been able to uh, negotiate extended settlement. Yes. Uh, I have been able to negotiate uh, pu putting in a DA prior to settlement. Yep. Um, these are after the drop of the hammer. Yes. Uh, as for other stuff, uh, minimal to no deposit, uh, immediate access, you can only assume that, you can only ask. Yes. And you've, the, the hammer's dropped, so therefore you've bought the property. Yes. So yeah. is there any other better way to... For auction try, situations? Trying to assure that you yeah. can get what you want before the hammer yeah. drops? Yeah. As renovators, that's a good question. As renovators, um, I mean, the reality is a lot of pro most of the properties get sold, um, for, you know, for sale, but a lot of properties in the inner city locations especially get sold via auction. So you can negotiate those terms prior to, um, prior to the auction and you have to negotiate. You can't go to the auction and then just bid and then uh, when the hammers come down in your favour go, I want to pay minimal deposit and they're going to say no, it's standard 42% day. So what you have to do is you have to basically get in contact with the agent or you can do it through your solicitors and you negotiate extended settlement. And what I pretty much in those situations where a property is going to auction, I say, I am willing to pay a price premium if I can get extended settlement of, uh, you know, 84 days as opposed to the standard 42% and I only want to pay 5% deposit. So I negotiate all that beforehand. But you can't, you can, I don't put a, I say I'm willing to pay a price premium, but I don't tell them how much. Price premium could be an, an extra dollar. So, so you go to the auction knowing that if you get the house, you've got these conditions. Yeah, you have to, that all has to be negotiated prior. Yeah. You can never... I mean, you've been fortunate in that situation where you had... Were you the highest bidder? I was just lucky to yeah. get what I wanted after. And sometimes after. you do get lucky at yeah. auctions. Nobody's there and they just get desperate. So sometimes lucky's well, on your side. Lucky in a sense that I got what I wanted after the price. Yep, so. exactly. But as renovators, you need to have all your conditions negotiated on paper. So email these through to the agent, get their response back, and then you take that piece of paper to the auction. So when the auctioneer comes down, the hammer comes down in your favour, it's already been pre-arranged. But you always say that, I'm willing to pay a price premium 
for immediate, um, for extended settlement, immediate access, okay, uh, and minimal deposit, extended settlement. 